to do TikTok, so. time to rock. Oh, t- TikTok. Are we live? Do we have to be? Do we have to be careful what we we're say? Live. Now? Yeah, yeah. You got to be careful what what, yeah, what yeah. you say now. You, oh, okay. you can't exactly. you can't be blabbing that you're secretly an undercover Christian who's pretending to be an ex-Muslim right. atheist. AP. Don't, don't, don't say it. Don't say it. Haters. TM. Don't, don't let them. Bunch of ugly dudes. I gotta share the platform with. My goodness. <laughs> I I feel very bad for you that you have to sit down here with me. TM Cross Pulse says the Dizzel is still busy with eBay. <laughs> <laughs> Good Guys, night. the eBay situation is is hilarious. Um, that's some that's some fun stuff. I'm I'm mainly interested in seeing what happens. Like if eBay, if if eBay blocks me, that's interesting. Um, if people are just posting fake bids that they're going to take down later, then you know that's something else. Uh, if if it actually goes through and people, and 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 I've managed to monetize keyboard jihadis everywhere, and now I can fund multiple ministries through my my beautiful artwork that's cool so no matter what happens no matter what happens it's uh it's fun and interesting all right well ladies and gentlemen we went live uh earlier in the day than what i normally do mainly for our european viewers so uh why not guys uh let me know where you're where you're watching from if you're in europe um because basically we want to know if this actually Helps because when we get when I go live at eight, I get some complaints um, saying, "Hey, come on, I'm in Europe." Um, and uh, all right, so we're going to cover obviously Muhammad versus the Ten Commandments, and both AP here and Sam Shimon have been dealing with this issue. AP through his videos, Sam, and articles for a very long time, and it's a very important issue. But before we get started, uh, mm-hmm. AP, why don't you? Tell everyone a little bit about yourself. I got a link to both your channels. Me. Both your channels and links to your Patreon accounts are in the description box. But why don't you tell everyone? Did you hear me? <laughs> why do I need to introduce myself? <laughs> I'm the apostate prophet. Who doesn't know me? But go ahead. <laughs> no, I was trying to say uh, I'm not important. I don't need to introduce myself. I don't need a name. No, you're humble. People, people do not need to know me. People do not need to know who I am. Uh, anyway, uh, no need for that. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm apostate prophet, uh, Ridvan Aydemir. I am an ex-Muslim, a former Muslim, uh, who was born in, in Germany and lived in Turkey and now lives in America. I am a very outspoken uh, Islamophobe uh, who is um, a big bigot. And I do a lot of, lot of work against Islam. Um, not because Islam is bad in any way, but simply because uh, it's like I have a personal problem with Islam just because you know I don't like Islam. I don't want to practice Islam, which is why I think, hey, why don't I just go and you know put out some hate against Islam? So that's what I'm doing uh, here. Uh, and uh, I do that by going into very uh, deep research of Islamic matters that I personally wouldn't know about because I was never a real Muslim to begin with, uh, although I call myself an ex-Muslim. Uh, and yeah, that's that's what I'm doing. And I have a YouTube channel called The Apostate Prophet, where I uh, regularly publish videos for money while pretending to be uh, an atheist. Whereas behind the scenes, I secretly come together and uh, pray with you as a good Christian on a regular basis. Uh, yeah, we, that's uh, why I, I occasionally, uh, just so everyone knows, I occasionally detect a hint of sarcasm in uh, AP's comments. Um, that's just me. I could be, I could be a little off base there. Um, Uh, Hey, Sam, here's an actual, uh, uh, here's a, here's a good quick question from you because, uh, it's pretty cool. People are all over the place, all over, uh, Africa, the Middle East, Europe, um, all the way out to Indian, Australia and so on. But, uh, Sam, this is always an interesting question. Amir said, Sam, were you a Muslim before? And that's kind of historically Uh, a kind of, eh. Yeah, maybe yeah, yeah, a little yeah. bit. So why don't you give yeah. your, why don't you give a little background and, and answer that question? Yeah. Okay, let me answer that. I usually don't share that detail because I don't want Muslims to think I'm using that as a platform to open doors. Yeah, like for... the apostate prophet here. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, apostate, <laughs> I gotta say, you are so humble about you being a nobody. I mean, it was oozing out of your pores. <laughs> you won gorgeous Turkish beast and emphasize on Turkey. All right, anyway, but you are from Turkey, right? <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You big yeah. turkey, you. Anyway, but uh, <laughs> coming to the issue at hand, uh, and I don't like to share this for one reason, because I don't want Muslims to say that I'm just making it up in order to get people to invite me to talk about Islam. Early on, <clears throat> when I was making my way back to faith, even though my background had been Christianity, I ran into an African-American guy named Hallis. Now, he was a member of the Nation of Islam, and this is around maybe 17 and a half, 18 years old. I was around close to 18. I had no idea what Islam <clears throat> was all about. Now, why, why is that ironic, guys? My parents are from the Middle East. I was born in Kuwait. You would think if anyone knew about Islam would be me. But my parents were very nominal Christians, did not talk about Christianity, let alone about Islam. So I learned about Islam from this guy. But I didn't know that his version of Islam was false because he was a member of the Nation of Islam. So he was a follower of Louis Farrakhan. And he kept talking about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Prophet Muhammad, and Master Farad Muhammad. I had no idea these are different individuals. I'm thinking it's the same person, right? So he talked about the Holy Quran. And he, then he gave me the Holy Quran, started reading it. And by the way, he called it Holy Quran. I don't call it Holy Quran. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'm just repeating we, what he said. We call it you know? we call it holy, but we have an E in there, Sam. Yeah, <laughs> holy moly, 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 moly. Anyway, anyway. So start reading, and I was just, I was shocked because the prophets of the Bible, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jesus were mentioned quite frequently, and then that got me on a journey. Now during this time, the internet hadn't caught on. There was no YouTube, so you'd have to go to stores and get VHS tapes. So I learned about Malcolm X, picked up the autobiography by Alex Haley, read Malcolm X, got VHS tapes on Malcolm X, and then when I heard his journey and how he embraced true Islam, I became convinced in my sick, perverted mind, Islam must be true. Muhammad must be a true prophet, but I didn't run into Sunni Muslims. I'm still learning, I'm still green. But then that got me to go back and read the New Testament. So within two years, from around 18 to 20, as I'm reading the New Testament, I'm falling more in love with the Jesus of the New Testament and seeing that he's the Son of God. But I'm still convinced Muhammad is a prophet, so two agonizing years. In my mind, I'm thinking Muhammad is a prophet, but hold on, the Quran says Jesus isn't the Son of God, and yet the New Testament, Jesus is the Son of God. So finally, after two years, by the grace of God, the Lord broke my shackles, and then I came to the conclusion Muhammad was sincere in what he said in many ways. And in other ways, we can see he was a greedy, self-centered. Yeah, I'll refrain from what I was about to say. But anyway, so then I was convinced because in my worldview, there's a spirit realm. Spirit beings exist. Satan exists. I was convinced that the reason why he was sincere is because he may have been demonized and some evil spirit masqueraded as an angel of light like we read in 2 Corinthians 11, 14. And that's why he was convinced that he was a prophet. And so finally, I was able to see him for what he was. And as time progressed, I know what he is, an antichrist, a son of the devil. So that's my journey. And uh, I have to say, I really appreciate uh, you taking <clears throat> a lot of time and explaining that. Um, it was very good listening to you, although it was completely irrelevant and uninteresting. You're, you're a very good man. But, you are but, the greatest cure to insomnia next to David Wood, and I appreciate you from my heart. Thank now, you. Thank now, uh, why don't, why don't uh, each of you, why don't each of you um, uh, <clears throat> explain basically why you're continuing down this road, knowing the hostility that you encounter. You could obviously be doing something else right now uh, because this, this, this comes up over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Um, every time we talk about Islam, why are you guys obsessed with Islam? Right? Like, wait a minute. <laughs> Your God seems awfully, awfully obsessed with us and what we believe. Yeah. Your prophet yeah. seems awfully obsessed with us. As soon as we respond, it's, why are you so obsessed with our religion? Uh, so, guys, why do you why do you now do what you do instead of, uh, you know, getting sick of it yeah. and doing something else? Yeah. Want to go ahead, Sam? Well, it's up to you, my friend, because you are the example of humbleness, and I love you for it. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, all joking aside, <laughs> all joking aside, my introduction to Islam, apart from that African-American, <clears throat> I had a friend, and I know it's going to shock even AP to hear this. Before I got into apologetics, I used to be into bodybuilding and kickboxing. AP, 
in my day, friend, I know you're going to you're going to doubt this because, you know, you're skeptical. You're even skeptical about your skepticism. But that's how you are. But that's how you roll. Uh, I was such a great kickboxer. You know, I used to go to all those grocery stores and I used to kick more boxes all day, all night than any other person in the neighborhood. No one out kicked boxes more than me. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So as I, I was to say, I believe you with all my heart. But go thank on. you. That's why, that's why I love you, man. I don't care what David Wood says about you. So what happened was during this time, I had a good friend. He was Bosnian. I, I can't mention his name, so I don't want to mention his name because, unfortunately, years later, he actually became a little loony. He became mentally deranged, so I don't want to mention his name. So during this time, uh, I had a good friend. He was a Bosnian, and Bosnians, for the most part, are Muslims. His dad was a professional boxing coach, so he would teach me how to box to go with my kickboxing, and I would teach him how to lift weights. So as I started becoming more zealous about Christianity, I started talking to him about Jesus and being the Son of God, and he started liking it. And unfortunately for me, the Muslims that he associated with noticed that he wasn't going to Friday prayers and noticed that he wasn't as devout of a Muslim. So they started asking questions and he started telling them, well, hey, you know what? This Christianity thing, this New Testament thing sounds interesting. Jesus, son of God. So they asked him, who's the missionary that's poisoning you? So they knew, quote unquote, there was a missionary. All so the I way, met, all the way yeah. back then, Sam Shimon was poisoning people. You ain't lying, man. But you know what? They were still, drinking the Kool-Aid, not it, the yeah. Haterade. They're not drinking the Haterade, though, Hater. So to make it really, to make a short story long, <clears throat> they wanted to meet the missionary. They met me. I didn't know much about the faith. They didn't know much about the faith. So they brought in this big gun, this Muslim da'i, an apologist. And he's still active in Chicago. He was a real estate broker, but he's retired. And he devotes himself to going around churches and debating Muslims. Well, I had no idea about Christianity with any great depth or Islam. So he walked in the church we were in, tore me to shreds, obliterated me, decimated me with so-called contradictions in the Bible and verses showing, showing that the Trinity is not true. Jesus isn't the Son of God. And by, mind you, I'm green. I don't know much about what the Trinity is. Sam, Sam, so I, then, I, I, yeah. I, I just have to say, my goodness, <laughs> that guy made the biggest mistake yeah. in the history of Islam, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> do <laughs> if 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 his God had known the future, he'd have been like, "What? Well, just stay away from this Sam Shamoon guy. <laughs> stay away from him." Yeah, dude, and you ain't lying. When he did that, you know how our nature is, Dave. Mm -hmm. You and me. Uh, when we get bullied, what do we do? When someone bullies us, we don't like it. We don't take it too well. We crush our enemies. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. We crush you. Ooh, ooh, ah, ooh, ooh. <laughs> anyway, so. I started crying out to God. I said, Lord, if you give me answers to his objections, I will commit myself to making sure no other Christian gets humiliated by any other Muslim as long as I live. And here I am. That's why I do what I do. Because the Muslims came, like you said, I wasn't looking for Muslims. I wasn't even attacking Islam. I was just telling my buddy about the New Testament. We were good friends. They came attacking me and trying to humil humiliate me and in a church in front of other Christians on top of that. And that's why I do what I do. Hey, uh, quick, quick comment here. So I've been, uh, I've been posting where uh, people's comments about where they're coming from because it's, uh, yep, it's, uh, it's pretty much all over the world. I haven't seen Antarctica yet, um, but or more or Mars, but I've seen pretty much everywhere else. But uh, this one comes from the Cash Man, and uh, I gotta, I gotta, I just gotta say, Cash Man, you're, I'm the Cash Man. How are you gonna be the Cash Man? <laughs> <laughs> How are you going to be the cash man? Thanks to all these uh, these Dawa teams. Thanks to all these Dawa teams trying to get us shut down. I'm the I'm the cash man now. It's just like it's just like with Sam Shamoon, right? People keep people keep messing with the wrong one sometimes, and then it doesn't work out the way the way they want. Yeah. So so now we know the origin of Sam Shamoon. Someone messed with the wrong one, and this led to <laughs> Sam obliterating Islam. Uh, how about you? How about you, AP? I mean, because, you know, we 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 see what goes on in the videos and on Twitter and, um, you know, I get the same kind of abuse heaped on me, insults, threats, all this stuff. I know why I keep going. I'm a psychopath. But what, what's your excuse? I'm crazy. No. Um, <laughs> that's it. I'm done. <laughs> Let's, let's let's move forward. All no, right. uh, I have. Um, well, it's it's you know throughout my life I grew up in a in a, in a very religious Muslim family. Uh, growing up, my parents were very religious. I just talked about that today. Um, they would, uh, although they were not as strict on me as uh, many other uh, Muslim parents that I know are. They um, they themselves were very 
uh, religious, very observant. They were they tried to make sure that uh, me and my siblings go on the same path. Um, uh, for a long time, I didn't. I was always kind of, uh, you know, in my own world, uh, doing my own thing. At some point in my life, I became uh, extremely really religious. That was I was uh, exploring a meaning in life. I was looking into different uh, political ideas, into different philosophies. Uh, something big happened. My uh, aunt was uh, my uh, my aunt died. She was killed by her uh, former husband. Wow. And uh, wow. we had long conversations with her about about religion, about belief, and stuff like that a lot. And um, she was something like my best friend. And when that happened, it just affected me a lot. And a few months later, from uh, me just relating to her, uh, looking for her, and um, remembering all the stuff that we went through. I guess I kind of got myself pulled closer to uh, Islam, although the opposite should have happened logically. But um, then I went really deep into Islam. I became very religious. I stopped doing everything that is uh, un-Islamic. I started living a very, very uh, religious life, studying day and night, reading day and night. Uh, thinking day and night. I had so many uh, questions, even when I was at the peak of my uh, Islamic religiosity and when I really, truly believed in it. I had so many questions that were always there in my head. And um, I don't want to go in much into the details of that, but eventually I, um, you know, I, I, st I stopped believing in that religion. Um, and then I found myself in this in this void, and I was uh, very sad and depressed. And then I was contacted by, uh, by by Mossad, and they said, "Hey, we have a special branch for people who criticize Islam and who claim to be ex-Muslims." And they offered me a lot of money, and I accepted that offer. And uh, now I'm being funded by Jews to criticize Islam yeah. on YouTube. No, I'm no, just kidding. Um, hmm. I, I just I just can't stop with that. Yeah, you can't. Uh, <laughs> they're not air conditioning here. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, no, what happened yeah. is that <laughs> what happened is that I realized, you know, I was I was very frustrated by how I lived my life and how yeah. I was brought up with this whole uh, with this whole Islamic attitude of uh, kind of hating the world, hating um, groups of people, hating myself, being having such a an extremely restricted life, completely based on uh, false and inconsistent beliefs, and how that defined my life. And I I myself spent uh, a great deal of time in uh, groups, in Dawa groups that um, go out and invite people to Islam. And I experienced how these missionary groups have certain tactics, have certain strategies, how they uh, don't openly lie, but implicitly lie to people, you know, how they omit things, how they uh, use certain strategies to, to, to bring people closer to Islam and how they really uh, strive for a world dominated by Islam in a very dark way. And I just looked at uh, Muslims in the West and missionaries in the world and how they keep pretending that that is not what they are about and that is not what they are doing, how they keep pretending that the real Islam that we all know, if we just look into it a, re a little bit, was not the real Islam. And they do that. They hide that in the public until people find their way into Islam. Then they reveal the true Islam, and then you are not supposed to leave Islam. So I, I saw this whole evil thing going on, and I just um, I was always a person who was more about uh, doing some something you know ideologically or changing something in the world rather than uh, pursuing my, uh, my 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 fun in the world. So I thought, hey, the best thing I could do is to go out there and to really use what I have learned and use what I have seen and start uh, speaking out against Islam. It's, uh, it's kind of harsh because it cost me a lot of relationships in life, including uh, very close relationships that I had from the beginning of, beginning of my life. Um, I get a lot of hate, a lot of dirt, as so do you and both of you. But it's, it's worth it. It is worth it. Because, because when, I, when I look back, I feel like I think to myself so often, I wish uh, hundreds of years ago or in the past, there had been people who, uh, you know, stood up and uh, stood up to the system and changed the world and told people how things really are. I wish there had been people who, you know, who, who, who put some effort into stopping Islam, into enlightening the world. And I thought, you know, if I feel this way, maybe I should be in my time a person who contributes to this so that a person in the future doesn't have to wish for the same thing. So that in the, so that in the future, people can live better lives without this uh, terrible ideology that so many people suffer from. So that's kind of what motivates me. And I really don't care how, how, how much uh, hate I receive, although they really think they can demoralize us with that. I really don't care. <laughs> 
All right, so now everyone, yeah. everyone knows hey, everyone. Just let you know. Hey, What's listen, uh, my mentally challenged, oversized brother walked in. He turned on the air condition. He'll turn it off when he leaves. So that's, that's, okay. you know, that's my control. You didn't smash him. I can't because I don't want it to be recorded on YouTube and used against me in okay. court law. <laughs> that's probably why he knows he can get away with it. He's like, oh, Sam, Sam's live now. There's the, now yeah. I can get away with it, so he he can't even smash me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> you're good. You're good. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, um, now that everyone knows everybody, we are going to talk about Muhammad versus the Ten Commandments. I just have to point out that I wanted to, uh, I hope this was impressive enough. I wanted to make this as impressive as possible to put myself, uh, to make myself look very good uh, in front of everybody. Uh, I hope it worked. And yeah, I appreciate well. the time that you gave me for that. Yeah. And, but I am um, impressed by the fact that what should have taken two minutes, it took you about an hour. You yeah. are massively <laughs> impressive. You yeah. have a talent, man. I mean, you. there's no one like you. I love you, man. I love you. I appreciate that, Sam, very much. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, for, 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 uh, for your uh, sarcastic intros there, uh, Yemeni said, uh, AP, did you let Muhammad Hijab write your bio? So that's, uh... <laughs> all right, so we have a bunch of countries uh, uh, around the world all watching our discussion here of Muhammad versus the Ten Commandments. And they're kind of a couple different issues. I wanted uh, both uh, AP and Sam on for this one because AP has been making uh, videos dealing with these topics. He recently posted a video um, arguing that uh, whoever started Islam didn't seem to know much about the, uh, the earlier Abrahamic religions. And uh, in an earlier video before that, uh, that Allah seems to have forgotten his name, which he once thought was important. <laughs> but that would actually fit in, right? I mean, I mean, you know, if, if, if Muhammad is receiving his revelations when he's in Mecca and he's receiving these, hey, you know, to you be your religion and to me be my religion. And Muslims tell me there he meant what he said. But, you know, later in Medina, he's receiving revelations. Fight those who do not believe in Allah. And they say, no, he doesn't mean that. It seems like Allah's cognitive faculties are kind of wearing down over time. So you can imagine he's going to forget. He's going to forget all sorts of important <laughs> yeah. details, uh, even his own name, apparently. So we're going to we're going to uh, deal with those kind of issues uh, at, here at the beginning. And AP can uh, share his thoughts on that. It is kind of weird because he's an atheist uh, talking about uh, Muhammad not knowing about the Bible. But it's actually our view, right? Like like Sam and I, we, we use the Islamic dilemma. But guess what? You, you know, even if you don't believe in the Bible, or the Quran, yep. you can use the Islamic dilemma and say, hey, the Quran affirms the Bible. I don't believe in the Quran. I don't believe in the Bible, but the Quran affirms the Bible and contradicts the Bible. And therefore, Islam has uh, a problem. And same on issues like this. So uh, AP is going to cover kind of these some of these issues. Sam, you can jump in um, mm -hmm. on, on these same issues. Then after, after we spend a little time on that, we're going to show that Muhammad actually broke Sam, is it is it all of the Ten Commandments? Every single one oh, of them. Oh my and I, goodness! I'm, I can't post the link here, but I'm going to give it to one of the mods, your mods, to do so. I, I will. I will. I will add it to. Page. I will add it. You talking about your your blog article on this? Yeah. I will I add it. I'll add it to the every description. Every single one. Every I'll add it to the description, and you can cover. Uh, I'll add it to the description for for more information. But yeah, this is so interesting, right? Uh, because originally, originally the the doctrine of Ismat al Anbiya, God Allah's protection of the prophets. Uh, for the, about the first two centuries of Islam was just that Allah is going to protect a prophet from continuing in sin or from persisting in sin. And so that's why they didn't have a problem with something like the satanic verses, right? Well, you know, yeah, Muhammad promoted polytheism and uh, committed all sorts of shirk and so on and promoted, you know, belief and prayers to these other goddesses. But, you know, it's okay because Allah took him out of that. Whereas later, Later, it came to be that 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 God's going to protect prophets from from all major sin, and so if that's the if that's the Islamic view now that Allah will protect a prophet from sins, then you've got a, you've kind of got a problem with Muhammad breaking all of the Ten Commandments, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, it's like exactly. it's like he went it's like he went down the list. What are the rules? Oh, that's a rule. I'm breaking it. Oh, that's a rule over there. I'm breaking that one too. What has God said? Oh yeah, I'm breaking it all. I'm breaking it all. But I'm I'm free of all major sin, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, come on, guys. All right. So AP, you can you can jump into this kind of kind of how, however you want here, and I'll go ahead and, and Sam, I'll go I'll go ahead and uh, pull your link put your link in there. All Thank right. you. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. So um, 
as you said, I, I don't believe in uh, God. I'm, I'm an atheist, uh, but I talk about these issues quite a lot. I talk uh, like one or two of my major arguments against Islam on my channel uh, right now are about uh, the name Yahweh and also about uh, the Kaaba, for example, and uh, generally the, the, the pagan origins of Islam. It doesn't matter whether I believe in that or not, because what matters is that uh, Islam claims to have a very firm foundation uh, and to be very consistent with uh, Abrahamic religion. So it's, it's foundation claims are that it is that uh, that Allah is the same God that uh, that is also the God of Christians and Jews but then when you uh, look at the knowledge and the scripture that Islam gives us you see so many flaws and so many inconsistencies with this religion which uh, makes it look like uh, the, the the claims of Islam are completely false and you don't need to believe in in, in the other religions in order to to come to that conclusion uh, so I, I recently uh, addressed this issue again because I published a video on the Ten Commandments and in that I talked about how um, the Ten Commandments are a foundational uh, set of uh, rules and laws in Christianity and Judaism. So um, if Islam is based on the same foundations, then of course Islam should also be knowledgeable in this matter. But when you look into the Quran, the Quran never actually mentions the Ten Commandments and uh, it, it kind of uh, presents sheer ignorance on the matter. It talks about how Moses was given uh, some tablets and uh, on those tablets Allah wrote to down all things and instructions to all things that's what it says and it, it really sounds like it doesn't the, the Quran has no idea what it is talking about and what the Ten Commandments actually are or that there are those two tablets with the Ten Commandments on them it just uh, it, it just looks like Allah gave him some sort of scripture and it is very very vague on that the commandments are never uh, repeated in the Quran and uh, if you look at the commandments uh, two of the commandments actually um, in the Bible contain uh, the words or the term um, or make an emphasis on the Lord, which in Hebrew is Yahweh, which is uh, the name of God in the Bible. And um, that is not consistent with Islam because Islam doesn't have the name Yahweh in any scripture at all. If you look into the Bible, the Bible clearly says that uh, that God speaks to Moses. And uh, when Moses asks God what his name is, he says uh, that, that his name is Yahweh and that uh, this shall be his name uh, forever and for generations to come and that he shall be remembered this way. And that name is repeated throughout the Bible over and over again. I, I, don't, believe, I don't know how many times, but uh, thousands of times, I believe. And it is... Uh, placed in English with the Lord but that is his uh, his name um, now I made a video about this before I, I even made two videos about how uh, the name Yahweh doesn't exist in Islam and how it came to be this way and why this means that Islam uh, loses a lot of credibility. Now, as said, the Bible says that uh, Yahweh is God's name. It refers to uh, God as Yahweh numerous times and it clearly also says that this will be his name forever. But if you look into the Quran, if you look into Islam, in Islam, God's name is Allah. Allah does not only mean uh, God, as people often falsely think, it is directly his name and his title. Yeah. God, God is Allah. That is that is who he is. And he doesn't have a name called, um, called Yahweh. Yahweh never exists. Yahweh is never mentioned in any scripture at all, anywhere, uh, which is which is very strange. Um, and the reason for that is probably that Muhammad uh, took the whole idea of the one God from the Christians and the Jews, and, uh, and 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 people in his region were referring to God as as Allah or Allah or Elaha, and he he took he took that uh, from them, and he thought, hey, that is uh, the one God, because they never mentioned God by his actual name, which is Yahweh. He uh, it never occurred to him that the that God's name is actually Yahweh, because they never mentioned it, because they're not supposed to mention it, because in the Ten Commandments, one of the commandments is that you shall not take. Uh, God's name, which is Yahweh, in vain, which is why Jews completely abstain from saying that name, which is why that never occurred to Muhammad. Uh, by, fact, by, by, by the way, yeah, does everyone does everyone uh, does everyone catch that? Um, Jews didn't like to use the name Yahweh while they're speaking for fear of accidentally misusing the name or of, of taking the Lord's name in vain. 
Uh, Sam, they, so even even when even when Jews were quoting things like uh, yeah. like the Shema and stuff, yes. lots of times they would replace it with a different word because they didn't yes. want to say. Is, is, is that correct? Hundred percent. They would if they're speaking Hebrew, they would say Adonai. If it's Ar Aramaic, it would be Mar, and in Greek it's Kyrios or Kyrios. And by the way, I don't want people to think I'm laughing at AP, but AP, just to let you know, this guy takes a shot. He put a comment where a guy said Chuck Norris is better than Bruce Lee, so that's why I was laughing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he's a hater. But yeah, yeah, just to repeat that point, they would replace it with the word Lord. So if it's uh, Ar a Hebrew, they would say Adonai. If it's Greek, they would say Kyrios, Kyrios. Aramaic Mar. So they would say Lord instead of Yahweh out of reverence for the name. Yeah, yeah. so so guys, just, just to be clear, because this is actually this is a this is a very important point that AP is uh AP is covering right now. Uh namely that th think think about two possibilities here. Either either Muhammad is is getting his revelations from from Allah, in which case Allah should really know what he's talking about when he's talking about, you know, the previous scriptures and the previous revelations and so on. Or Muhammad's kind of, he's just picking this stuff up from Jews and Christians and the, and the people around him. Well, if Muhammad's just getting his, revela his revelations and his ideas from the people around him, right? So he has, you know, he learns about the, pre the previous revelations from Jews and Christians. If that's where Muhammad, if, the, if those are Muhammad's sources of information, then it makes sense that he wouldn't even know what God's name is because Jews didn't like saying the name, right? They were, right. they were worried about it. So they would say things like Lord and so on, or they, or they, or they would use the name that's common in area. So if, if they're speaking Arabic and, and people are calling, uh, calling God Allah or something like that, they would use that for fear of right. misusing uh, the name of God. And so if Muhammad is just getting his revelations from the people around him, we wouldn't expect him to know what God's name is. That would just be yeah. forgotten. Exactly. Whereas if he's getting revelations from Allah, we would expect Allah to be able to say, oh, by the way, here's my name that I revealed to the Jews. They don't like to say it very much because they're very careful, but here's, here's the name I revealed to them. And you just don't. And so all of these things, they keep these things keep happening over and over again, where we can say two possibilities. Either he's getting this, I mean, there are other possibilities, like he could be getting revelations from a demonic source or something like that. But the main the main things we're considering is usually usually the Muslim view, which is he's getting these revelations from God, and the view that, you know, he's picking these things up from from people around him. And over and over and over again, you can just say, What's more likely here? That this came from God? Because exactly. it's it's the same thing with uh with uh you know, Allah not knowing what the doctrine of the Trinity is, not being able to say it accurately, right? I, ex I, you know, I understand Muhammad, if he's just hearing Christians talk about, you know, oh, there's God the Father, oh, and there's Jesus the Son, oh, and there's the mother of Jesus, that's Mary. I understand Muhammad misunderstanding that and thinking that's what we mean by the Trinity. Very strange if Allah makes that mistake. Very strange. And so over and over and over again, we find that the hypothesis that's confirmed is that Muhammad's just getting his revelations from the people around him. And occasionally I would say from some demonic sources, but I would say at least we have a ton of evidence that he's just gathering information for his religion from, from people around him. So guys, that's actually a very important point about about Allah not knowing what his name is, Allah forgetting his name. But go ahead, go ahead, if you continue. So the, the, no, the, the thing really is that, uh, you know, uh, Christians ha still have the Bible. You know, you have you have the same scripture that uh, that, that Jews have. Uh, Whereas in Islam, in Islam, the sources claim to be the same, but uh, Islam completely rejects uh, the reading of the Bible because, um, for example, we have a hadith in which Muhammad uh, admonishes uh, Omar, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I, I believe Omar reads the reads the Torah or something and uh, yeah. Muhammad, Muhammad, tell, Muhammad admonishes him and uh, basically implies uh, that he shouldn't be reading this and that when you hear the people of the scripture, meaning the Christians and the Jews, uh, read something from or mention something from their scriptures that Muhammad Muslims should say we neither believe nor disbelieve, but that you should basically stay away from the Bible. So uh, Islam only has the Quran, only has the tiny knowledge of the Quran, which is a very small book compared to uh, compared to the to the whole collection of the Bible, and. Uh, because of the fact that Islam doesn't have the Bible and only has the Quran, Islam is only Islam is also completely devoid of uh, basic Abrahamic, basic biblical information, such as that uh, that God's name is Yahweh. As you mentioned, uh, Jews are so sensitive about the matter that they uh, that they use different uh, words instead of Yahweh. They say uh, Hashem, which means the name, or 
they say Adonai, which is uh, our Lord, when they, uh, even when they read the scripture. So uh, Muhammad could have never actually heard them say uh, the actual name of God, Yahweh, which is why he was completely unaware of that. If he had received his revelations from Allah, Allah would have probably at some point included this into the scripture and explained that this is his name and that this should be protected and remembered. But it never happens. There is not a single place in Islamic scripture where the name Yahweh ever occurs. If you ask Muslims, what the name of uh, Allah is. In fact, if you ask Muslims whether uh, God's name is Yahweh, they will uh, deny that. They will either say that they do not uh, know what that is, or they will say, no, that is not his name. That is just uh, a, a word that Jews used for God. But that is clearly wrong if you look at the Bible, if you look at biblical uh, history, uh, Jewish and Christian history. Uh, they will go on and claim that his name is Allah, and that he has uh, 99 uh, names that describe his characteristics, which are completely irrelevant to the matter, by the way. Uh, the funny thing is, um, now, I did say that uh, the name Yahweh is never mentioned in Islam, which kind of uh, really makes Islam look ridiculous and wrong and lowers its, re its, its reliability, its uh, credibility. But the name Yahweh is actually mentioned in Islam, in Islamic tradition and in Islamic scripture in a way unintentionally. Which is that um, you know different cultures use uh, names that uh, what's what's that called the, the, um, the Theophorus, that, yeah, the Theophorus, yes. the Theophorus. Yeah, names that contain uh, the name of their God. And, That's right. Uh, yeah, four names. Jew, Jews, Jews and Christians also use these names uh, abundantly. Jews and Christians also have names that contain the name of their, the name of, or, or the title of, of their God. And uh, Islam also took some of these names uh, because it based itself, because Muhammad based his uh, religion completely on, uh, or, or partially on Judaism and Christianity as much as he could, but then uh, completely failed it, of course. He butchered it because his foundation was uh, pre-Islamic paganism. But uh, in, in, appropriating uh, Jewish and Christian scripture and knowledge, he appropriated several uh, figures from the Bible, including prophets that have names which directly contain the name of Yahweh. And, uh, you know, examples to that are, um, refresh my memory. Um, Eliyahu. Eliyahu. Yeah. Eliyahu, which is one of the actually this that, that's the that's the most important of, of all those names Eliyahu yes. yep. because uh, Eliyahu directly there is no denying to that Eliyahu is mentioned in Islam as Elias and uh, it is mentioned several times including in one uh, verse it is mentioned that uh, Elias is uh, a very important a very uh, you know honorable a very beloved uh, prophet of, of Allah but uh, when you break the name Elias down, which is Eliyahu originally, it literally means my God is Yahweh. Eliyahu. El stands for God. Uh, the, the, the Yahweh in the end is uh, short Hold for on, Yahweh. AP, no, no, I got to correct you. According to Muhammad Hijab, it means God with us. How dare <laughs> you contradict Muhammad Hijab? Eliyah means my God with us. Oh, 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 be strong, be strong. I'm a teacher boy. <laughs> uh, guys, so uh, j just to uh, just to, to 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 recap this point, um, the God of the Old Testament seems it's seems to think it's very important for him to reveal his name. By the time you get to the Quran, they don't. Uh, he's totally forgotten what his name is, even though he's giving these uh, you know direct his eternal speech. This is his eternal speech here. Um, so he doesn't remember what his name is to reveal it, and yet, and yet, uh, his name is included in people's names that Jews would talk about, right? Jews would still use the names of people that have some meaning that includes the name of God. And notice, all of this is exactly what you would expect if Muhammad's just getting his getting his, his source of information is Jews and Christians and, and pagans and so on, and he's just sort of compiling this into his religion. Uh, by the way, William Young, he put it, as I was saying it, I was thinking, as I was saying this earlier, uh, I was thinking, hey, you could actually make a Bayesian argument out of this. Uh, and William Young said, you could formulate a Bayesian argument against right. Islam from the absence of Yahweh as God's name. Yeah, you could, you could make an entire series of arguments. And how this would work is, um, Bayesian arguments are very good at comparing the impact of evidence on two hypotheses. So you say, um, on the assumption that this hypothesis is true, so on the assumption that Islam comes from God, 
Um, how surprising is it that God forgets his name? Well, it's pretty surprising. You would expect him to, to remember his name. Uh, however, on the assumption that Muhammad is just getting his revelations from the people around him, um, how surprising is it that he doesn't know the name Yah Yahweh? Well, not surprising at all, right? So, the, so there you would say the evidence favors one hypothesis over another. But you can do this with like 50 different pieces of art, pieces of evidence, and show that the evidence always, always, always favors the hypothesis that Muhammad's getting this stuff from the from the people around him rather than from God. And so, yeah, I don't know if anyone's done that sort of thing before, but uh, I'm sure I'm sure I could. I just wanted to ask both of you guys one thing, though. Mm -hmm. uh, if Elias does not correspond to the Hebrew form of the name, because that would come from Greek, why is Allah inspiring Muhammad? That's a good one, too. That's what I want to ask. And then maybe you can unpack it more for them, David. But let me ask the question. You guys can chime in. By the way, turn off the air condition. Uh, wh why is Elijah's name in the Arabic Quran Elias? And in one place, it's Eliasin, as if you can pluralize it. If Arabic is a cognate language of Hebrew and Elias can only be der derived from the Greek Elias, why is that in the Quran? I'm really baffled. Can you guys help me? That that's that, that's another one you can make a total uh, you can make a Bayesian argument out of. Guys, guys, you get that? It's the same thing with with Injil, right? You have you have whatever words were originally being used in Hebrew and Aramaic, but Allah seems seems to frequently use the Greek, the the Arabic versions of the Greek words rather than the Arabic versions of the Hebrew words or the Hebrew words themselves and so on. So once again, far more probable, this is far more probable if, if Muhammad is just listening to the people around him rather than the, the idea that this is the eternal speech of Allah. This is Allah's eternal speech. Why is Allah in his eternal words saying, you know what form I'm going to use in Arabic? I'm going to use the Arabic version of the Greek version of the Hebrew, <laughs> right? Why is, why, is he, why is he doing that? And just uh, just giving us this opportunity to, to make fun of it. Dave, you're confused. That's just one of the many Qirat. The other Qirat got it right. What's wrong with you? And it was in the copy that the goat ate. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> that, goat, that goat ate some holes in the narrative. All right, AP. There, there are some uh, more issues. Like, um, you know, we talked about the name uh, Elias or Eliyahu in its, uh, in its, in its original. And uh, the Quran adopts uh, Elias, which doesn't sound like the original, which uh, clearly says, my God is Yahweh, which is which should be clear to everybody. I mean, I knew people, I knew Muslims whose name was uh, Elias. And uh, I even had had one guy who was an imam called Elias, and I prayed behind him, not knowing that I'm praying behind a guy to Allah, who uh, a guy whose name is my God is Yahweh, which is very ironic, right? I mean, when when Jews use the name, uh, you know, uh, Elijah or, or Eliyahu, they are saying my God is Yahweh. When Christians use the name uh, Elijah or Eliyahu, they say my God is Yahweh. When Christians use the name uh, Elias, they are also saying my God is Yahweh without knowing that their God is Yahweh because their God's name is Allah, which is so interesting, isn't it? I mean, Muslims who's ne who know someone called Elias or who have opened the Quran and read the word Elias should really uh, think about where this is going and uh, how this could have happened. But if we want to depart from the example of, uh, of Elias, which is... Uh, which 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 was adopted from uh, Greek into into Arabic. There are ser several other names in the Quran, including uh, the name of Zechariah, for example. He is mentioned as Zechariah in uh, the Quran, and Zechariah uh, also literally means um, Yahweh remembers. Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Yahweh remembers. That's what Zechariah uh, means. Uh, another example is Yahya in the Quran, and Yahya means. Uh, Yahweh is gracious, for example. There are uh, several other names. There is um, in the Hadith, for example, uh, Yusha is mentioned, which uh, I believe shares the same meaning as the name of, of Jesus, right? That's right, for sure. Right, Sam, do you want to explain yes. what uh, no, yeah, the meaning of Jesus That's what you said something interesting. You said Yahya, and you and I both know, David knows, mm -hmm. John's Arabic name is not Yahya. Yeah, yeah. It's actually traced to Mandian sources. His name would be Yohanna, and that uh -huh. is. Yeah, but see, notice even there, Yahya is butchering. But yeah, Yusha is supposedly the name of Joshua. And Jesus' Hebrew name is Yeshua, shortened form of Yehoshua. So his name too would be Joshua. So you're right. Yusha, according to the Hadith, is the name of Joshua. 
Now, Joshua, his Hebrew name is Yehoshua, and that's where we get the name Jesus from. Yehoshua, Yeshua, which means Yahweh is salvation. So you're absolutely right. And yep. and, and so, a, 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 along along those lines, um, wherever, wherever, wherever Allah's getting his names from, you'd never in a million years get Isa out of that, would you? 100% <laughs> not. He says no, nothing to do with Yeshua. Yeshua in or Isha in Aramaic, but hey, that's another story. Anyway. So think about this: um, Islam claims that um, that Allah is the eternal God who spoke to Abraham, who spoke to Moses, who spoke to all those uh, prophets. Because every character that is mentioned in the Quran is somehow a prophet, although uh, many of them in the Bible are not prophets. But um, so the Islam, Islam in the Quran claims that it was Allah who spoke to everybody and said that He is Allah, that He is the one God. But um, we have we have these we have these names that all refer to Yahweh. We have a name that clearly says uh, Eliyahu, which means My God is Yahweh. We have names that say Yahweh is salvation, Yahweh remembers, Yahweh is gracious. In the Bible, we have so many more examples of other names that also contain the name Yahweh. Many of them uh, are missing in the Quran, but there are so many more examples. For example, I can think of uh, Obadiah right now, or yeah, know, many, Isaiah. Many, yeah, Isaiah, many others that also uh, contain the name of uh, Yahweh, which are very important uh, characters. So it is quite obvious. Uh, a Muslim would, of course, claim that uh, the Bible has been at some point for some strange reason, somehow, somewhere corrupted, which is why you cannot trust the Bible. But you see that, uh, that, that the Jews have uh, and Christians have uh, traditionally, historically, these names that clearly refer to Yahweh as the one God and as uh, the name of God, whereas uh, not whereas you you, fi you don't find Allah anywhere ex except for uh, Elohim in the uh, in, in the Bible, which just means God, or you know, yep. yeah, which just refers to the, the word God, which is what uh, God is, not what His name is. So that is an entire concept that is uh, missing in Islam and which completely exposes Islam as an ignorant uh, religion that is simply based on what Muhammad heard and thought about uh, monotheistic belief. And we, we could go forever about how uh, how Muhammad's religion is actually based on uh, pagan origins, including uh, the, the, including the Kaaba and uh, pagan temples in, in Arabia and pagan practices in Arabia, like the like the black stone or circling the Kaaba or uh, putting these white dresses on or uh, sacrificing things around the Kaaba and so on. But this is just one major point which really exposes Islam as as an ignorant uh, religion, and this is part of why the Ten Commandments uh, do not exist in Islam and why even if they existed, even if they were adopted as they are from the Bible, then they wouldn't make sense in Islam because they contain uh, two emphasis on the name Yahweh, which does not exist in Islam. So, yeah, yeah there's yeah. that. And uh, quick question right here. And then uh, let's see. So John Beatty says, uh, just curious, how would you say Yahweh in Arabic? Um, yeah, the the idea here, John Beatty, and, and uh, yeah. you know, you guys, can, you guys can, yeah, you, you guys can can correct me. But generally, if you're doing, if you're doing transliteration or something like that, then you try and you try and replicate the sounds, right? Like, we're in, you know, we're speaking English right now, so we say Yahweh. That's supposed to be as close as we can get. Um, and there are some there are some different versions of this. Uh, like like is it Sam? Isn't there a suggestion that it's a uh, it's more along the lines of uh, yeah. Yahweh or something like that? Yeah, Yahovah. There's, yeah. there's Nehemiah Gordon, which they can listen to. He's a Karaite Jew. He's not Orthodox or Christian. He says that the medieval manuscripts written by rabbis actually show they pronounced it Yahovah, where we mm -hmm. get Jehovah. That's what he says. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah. anyway, I'm not the scholar, but that's what he claims. Yeah. Yeah. So so the idea is um, different languages sometimes have different sounds, right? Like e even 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 e e AP, you know, he, he grew up in Germany, even in Germany, we don't use, you know, the ch sound very much yeah, yeah. in in English. And then you get to you get to Semitic languages and they use. Them. So basically, if you're you're taking one word and putting it into another language, you try and come uh, you try and come close. But sometimes the word can go through multiple languages when it gets there. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so just just take my name, right? So in English we say David. 
Uh, in, in Arabic, they say Daoud, but notice that's 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 pretty similar. In Greek, they say David. Nowadays, they say Davida because I heard them call me that Davida. Um, so, but but notice <laughs> notice it's very similar, but there's some alterations in sounds because these sounds are more common in uh, you know in, in in the languages. But the issue arises when sometimes a word goes from Hebrew or Aramaic to Greek to something else, or go from Hebrew to Syriac to this to that, and then eventually gets in the the uh, you know the, the the language. And since it changes a little bit each time, you end up with something very very different. And so with with Islam, the question is why is why is Allah using all these words that seem like they went through Syriac or they went through Greek or yeah. something like that? Why why is why is that making any sense? It would make sense. It would make sense if he wasn't claiming this is his eternal speech. Looks like Allah's eternal speech has a lot to do with you know. <laughs> do you, do the you, guys, you guys see the problem? Yeah, it's it's like yeah. wait, this is his eternal, perfect, eloquent Arabic speech. And it's looking like he's getting all these words that are, you have foreign words. You have, you know, in the case of Isa, something that's not connected to anything. It looks like it's just a, just a big mistake. Um, and then you have words that, I mean, Allah just seems to take his words from any direction. And once again, that seems much more, much more probable uh, on the assumption yeah. that he's just getting his revelations from the people around him. Now, uh, AP, I, uh, Dave, oh, let me add this. I wanted to add this part to confirm what you're saying about how Allah's getting words from, let's say, Greek. Uh, one of the names given to the adversary in the Quran is Iblis. Guys, don't take my word for it. Iblis doesn't come from Hebrew. It is actually the Arabic form of the Greek Diabolos. Diabolos and comes from <coughs> Greek, Syriac, you get Iblis. Mm. So why does Satan have a Greek name? Can you explain that to me, uh, David? I'm really confused. <laughs> yeah, same, same thing Same thing with, with in, you know, Injil. I mean, that's the word for gospel. And that's like, isn't that like the Syriac version of the yeah, Greek concrete. word? Yeah, yeah. so it's like... It it, Evangelion or something like yeah. that. Right? Yeah. 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 yeah, so instead, yeah. instead of using the word, you know, a Hebrew word, and then putting it into Arabic... Allah uses a Syriac word that came from the Greek, right? And it's like, what, what is, what is he, what's Allah, what's Allah doing here? All right, AP, we know you have. It's so uh, funny, yeah. We know you have some stuff from your recent video, but uh, I think, I think, uh, Sam, if you want to start going through yeah. these uh, points, and then after, after you show how Muhammad violates these, then AP, you could talk about <laughs> Muhammad. Uh, I, just, why, I just want to add why, something quickly. Why he violated them, namely that he didn't even know what they are. Yeah, <laughs> I want to add something quickly to the mm -hmm. to the whole discussion about the name uh, Yahweh or Yehovah. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of funny. The premise of this uh, of us one, sitting here and wondering what the actual pronunciation of the name is, is that the name was so sacred, so important, uh, and that that the Jews were so sensitive about this matter about his name, that uh, that they never that they didn't pronounce it, and it was uh, preserved through scripture, which even the Jews, as they were reading it, didn't uh, pronounce as it is. It was so holy, so sacred, that they didn't say the name, and the actual pronunciation got lost over time. And we only have the letters that stand there. So that is the, the premise of the matter. And it is so important, but yet it is non-existent in Islam. Islam doesn't even care. Yeah, yeah. but here's the thing, APO, I just want to add to that. Now, if Muhammad supposedly is a prophet like Moses, let me add, let me piggyback off your argument. And I want guys to hear what he said, and uh, this argument that's airtight. Muhammad is supposed to be the prophet like Moses. And if the pronunciation name was lost, wouldn't we expect that Allah would inspire Muhammad to restore yeah. the correct pronunciation of the name if he's a yeah. prophet like Moses and worship the same God of Moses who's Yahweh? Yeah, exactly. That would, so what that would have solved everything. So what happened? Tell me what's up. I committed, what? You're saying he's a fake prophet? He, did, he had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> oh, 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 we crush you. <laughs> All right, go ahead. I'm your teacher, boy. Okay, you, you, you are supposed to go ahead. You're supposed to talk about the Ten Commandments. Well, I mean, I can go in any order you want me, Dave. You want me to start with his, uh, uh, how he violated the immoral? I mean, all ten he violated. So yeah. where do you want me to start? Uh, how about, <laughs> how about I just bring up the, how about I just bring up the Ten Commandments? Okay, read it. And again. then you can tell me where you want to stop and show me where Muhammad has gone astray. <laughs> Dude. Okay. Okay. Here we go. You just you, you just tell me to stop anywhere, and then you can show where Muhammad got something wrong. All right. Let's get this up on the screen. All right. So here we have the Ten Commandments. This is Exodus chapter twenty, and God spoke all these words, saying, "I am the Lord your God, 
who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the stop. house. Stop. See, I'm going to have to stop you every sentence. I've Already? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I didn't even finish one sentence, Sam. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating. This is all documented. Even right there, you got to stop. Notice he said, I am Yahweh, your God. Okay. Already AP did an excellent job of showing the names Yahweh. But to add to it, add to it. The God of Israel is a spiritual father to his covenant people. The God of Israel is a spiritual father to his covenant people. Exodus 4, 22, 23. For the sake of time, I'll just read Exodus 4, 22 to 23. You shall tell Pharaoh, Yahweh says, Israel is my firstborn, my son, my firstborn. Israel is my son, my firstborn. It's Exodus 4, 22, 23. And I've said to you, let my son go that he may serve me. And you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your firstborn son. So right off the bat, the God of Israel is the spiritual father of Israel. And he says, Israel's my firstborn son. Among all the nations, I have formed and set apart this nation to be my first son. Implication, other sons will follow. Meaning other nations that turn to the God of Israel will be sons and daughters of God. And yet in the Quran, chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran, and I'll just give you the references, guys. Chapter 5, verse 18. There, when the Jews and the Christians told Muhammad, chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran, we are sons of Allah, his beloved. And the responses say, why then does he punish you for your sins? Nay, you are but mortals that he created. So what did Muhammad say? My God is not the father to the Jews or the Christians. Why? Because in chapter 19, verses 88 to 93, Allah says, the highest relationship you can have with Allah, this is chapter 19, verses 88 to 93, is a slave to master relationship. So right there, the God of Israel is the father of Israel, spiritually, not biologically, and Muhammad's God isn't. And then real quickly, the God that brought Israel out of Egypt is the triune God. And I'm not making this up, just from the Old Testament, the God that saved Israel was Yahweh, the divine angel of Yahweh and the Holy Spirit. And just for the sake of time, in Exodus 14, verses 19 to 20, Exodus 14, verses 19 to 20, who was there with Yahweh saving Israel? The angel of God. The angel of God who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. So the angel is there directing the cloud, saving Israel from being destroyed by Pharaoh and his armies right when they arrive at the Red Sea and it's split by the power of God. So the angel is there. This is also confirmed in Exodus 23, 20 to 21. Real quickly, Exodus 23, 20 to 21. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you by the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Pay attention to him and listen to his voice. God is speaking about the angel. Listen to his voice. Why? Don't provoke him, for he will not pardon your disobedience, for my name is in him. Now, Dave, help me understand this. God says, don't mess with this angel, because he has the power to forgive you or condemn you in your sins. Why? Because he embodies my name. How can a creature embody the name, the nature of God, and do what only God does? Because even the Quran says, in chapter 3, verse 135, who can forgive sins but Allah alone? Isn't this proof this angel is no mere creature, Dave? Sounds like sounds like something interesting is going on. Mm -hmm. And the final one, we're the third person. Isaiah 63, verse 14, it says, As livestock that go down into the valley, Isaiah 63, verse 14, Yahweh's spirit caused them to rest. Now, help me to do the math here, Dave. Yahweh, the angel of Yahweh, Yahweh's spirit, all three of them were responsible in redeeming Israel out of Egypt. Does that sound like the Trinity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. So right, right. The first line, Muhammad stands condemned. Yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not looking, it's not looking good for Muhammad already. We're just getting started. So, so guys, did you catch that? Let's, uh, let me get this back up on the screen here. So all we, all we read was, and God spoke all these words, saying, "I am the Lord your God." So right there, you have Lord, and uh, Islam just doesn't know. God as Lord, because keep in mind, in, in Hebrew, that is Yahweh there, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and then out of the house of slavery. And Sam pointed out that the God of the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, is our heavenly Father. And therefore, if the Quran, since the Quran denies 
keep in mind, he's not just a, the Quran doesn't simply say that Allah isn't your biological father. According to the Quran, Allah is not your father in any sense, period. The only relationship you can have with Allah, according to the Quran, as Sam pointed out, is a slave to master relationship. So already, already, we're not dealing with the same God. So there's already a violation of the, 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 the opening two verses of Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. Um, and then in addition to that, if you actually pay attention to the teachings of the Torah, you have a triune God. And Anthony Rogers actually has a, an excellent ongoing series on that, which you can check out on my channel if you look up uh, the Trinity in the Old Testament playlist, where, where he actually goes through a lot of information on that. So right off the bat, Muhammad is wrong on this. All right, should we? Should we? Uh, should, should I keep reading, Sam? Yeah, yeah because uh, within a couple of lines, I want to stop you again. But go ahead. Okay. Yeah. You stop. Stop whatever it, you want. It, yeah. It, it looks. It looks very much like um, the author of the Quran when it when it says that uh, Allah is not their father. It looks very much like. Um, it has no idea why they use those terms. It has yeah, no idea 100%. why why the Jews and Christians refer to themselves or or, or use those <laughs> terms like like son. It just uh, so Muhammad just Muhammad just thinks that uh, Jews and Christians uh, say these things that they make this up. Yeah, he has no idea that that is actually in the scripture. Yeah, so guys, did you catch that? So God reveals in the Old Testament and the New Testament that He has a special relationship with people. Uh, we are, you know. Uh, men and women are, are sons and daughters of the living God. So Jews and Christians say that around Muhammad, and then Allah responds, what are you guys talking about? You guys just making this stuff up? Durr, you all know you're just slaves, right? Durr, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> wild. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, so again, verse 2, which we went through, but I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Mm. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting... Stop! Uh-oh. <laughs> Stop! Okay, I, thought, I thought he would have stopped, said, said no, stop yeah. like five times no. by now. But. No, I, w I wanted to, but I wanted him to finish the context. Okay, okay. Because right when he says, no other gods beside me, Allah is a God besides Yahweh. We've already established that. But again, I'm going to just read another corroborating verse. Leviticus 26, verse 1, to go with what you said. Leviticus 26, verse 1. You shall make for yourselves no idols, and you shall not raise up a carved image or a pillar, and you shall not place any figured stone in your land to bow down to it. Hmm. Uh -oh. Last time I checked, AP and David, and this is in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, it's part of the rites of pilgrimage. Didn't Muhammad smooch a black stone? Oh, he was Smother a, a black stone, wept on a black stone, and didn't it say in Bukhari that Omar ibn al Khattab, he went to kiss it and he looked at it, he goes, I know that you're a stone, stone that neither harms nor benefits. Had I not seen the Messenger of Allah kissing you, I would not kiss you. Hmm. That's Does such that a sound? profound hadith, yeah. It's, right? It's so important. So why again, AP and David Wood, did Muhammad venerate a black stone that was venerated by the pagans when the God of Moses says, you will not take stones and figured stones and venerate them? And Muhammad said, this is the place where you weep and you touch it and you kiss it. And he smothered it like a good little pagan. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely looks like... Uh... Well, it's, yeah. <laughs> As said, Islam is built on a, on a on a pagan foundation. It is built on the values and practices of the uh, pre-Islamic Arab uh, pagan era. It copies, uh, imp imports directly things that were done in that environment that these people did. Muhammad had to adopt certain things because he didn't uh, exactly know religion. He didn't exactly understand how to how to do religion. What he had, what he knew, was the pre-Islamic uh, pagan religion. And as he was trying to establish a more uh, monotheistic, a, a Jewish or Christian religion, he adopted all those practices, including including venerating or praying to a rock a stone which is not the single which is not which is not the only stone that exists in arabia there are uh, many of them and according to hadith also uh, there are different uh, kaabas that are found in different areas including wow. in yemen which uh, which 
according to the historical context, also contained different stones in different colors because they stood for uh, the veneration of their pagan gods. And they asked for things like fertility through those stones. And it is it is really incredible that Muhammad uh, establishes this practice of going and uh, venerating and asking that black stone for help, basically, which is pure blasphemy, which should be considered pure shirk. And even his uh, dear friend and future caliph uh, omar says looks at the stone and says uh, i wouldn't i wouldn't be doing this because i know you can't help me i wouldn't be doing this if, if muhammad had not done this yeah he, he clearly says it <laughs> and let me add two points to what he just said uh according to the hadith the black stone was originally white but it became black for oh, the yeah. sense of those kissing it now i want the christians i want this to sink in christians this is especially for you guys when muslims say well you know, uh, God would not punish an innocent man for our sins. He would not transfer our sins to Jesus. And yet, in Islam, the sins of the Muslims were transferred to a black stone, an inanimate stone. Now, let me repeat again what I just said. I want the Christians to get this. And even, AP, do a video on this for, for your audience so they can see how irrational Islam is, where they condemn the Christian view that Jesus chose to bear our sins. But in Islam, a white stone became black from the sins of all those that kissed it because it was absorbing their sin. The implication is a black stone bore the sins of the Muslims, turning black from their sins so they could be purified. That's the first problem. Second problem, in the same traditions, and here it is, it's from the article, it says in some ahadith, which say that the black stone is Allah's right hand on earth. So when you're kissing the black stone or touching the black stone, you're actually kissing Allah's right hand you're kissing and touching the right hand of Allah, right? And it says, in other words, whoever touches the black stone, he pledges allegiance to Allah, as it were, by giving his hand into the hand of Allah, which is why there's a narration, an authentic one, where, it's, where Muhammad says, on the last day, the black stone will be given eyes and a tongue to speak. Why? Because the black stone will be a shafi, an intercessor interceding for the Muslims that licked it, smothered it, and smooched it. Smoochy, smooch. Smoochy, smoochy. Someone said in the comment section, Kale said, their hands must be very dirty. That's also <laughs> a, a secular perspective on the matter. But yeah. So, uh, yeah, but, so David, uh, I, I want you to help me here. Didn't the pagans say the same thing, that the reason why they venerate stones is because they believe these are symbols of their gods and intercede before Allah? Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. Yep, yep, yep. And uh, so, Sam, this black stone will reveal itself as a conscious agent yes. at, at the judgment, right? So this is not yes. just some dead, lifeless stone. This no. is a living, breathing, talking, I can't say walking, I don't know if it's gonna get legs or something like that, but maybe it just floats around imagine, or something yeah. like that. But this <laughs> thing is actually gonna be there talking. Yep. Interceding for people. And they're actually going up, smooching it, kissing it. And this goes all the way back to Muhammad. So where Allah is making his judgment about people, the black stone will stand up and will say, hey, I know this guy. He yeah. uh, he, he touched me. He kissed me. He this kept me good. warm at night, AP. <laughs> <laughs> he gave me a lot of love and affection. He kept me so warm and snuggle. Thank you, Thank Abdul you. Rahman. Right. Hey, <laughs> on, the, uh, on the plus side, as far as origami is concerned, uh, making a rock is the easiest thing you can do. You just crunch and then bam, you've got uh, you've got uh, you've got your origami black stone. You just got to color it color it black. So that's going to be an easy project here uh, in the in the near future. Um, <laughs> it's ironic, Dave. One guy just said in the comments, he goes, "Man, that's racist. Why does it got to be black?" Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking, why got it? Why got to be a black stone, right? Because that happens over and over again, right? So Muhammad says, "Kill all dogs," and then people come back. It's like, wait, we need some dogs for hunting and stuff like that. Okay, just kill the black dogs. Just the black dogs black. are the ones with the demon. Oh, why got to be a black dog, Muhammad? Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Momo, you got issues, Momo. <laughs> oh boy. All right, we ready? We ready to? Uh, we ready to jump yep. back into this? Yep. All right. So you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the sea. You shall not bow down to them or smooch them. Mm -hmm. I say smooch <laughs> them, but that's obviously included here. Yeah. You yeah. shall not. But by, by the way, Sam. Yeah. When the Israelites went astray, started 
kissing stones and oh, yeah, venerating yeah. stones. When you would finally have a righteous king, a righteous king in Israel who would guy. say, hey, we need to get away from this paganism. What would what would the righteous king do? Yep, this is found in 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 3 and 4, but read verses 1 to 4. 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. Uh, the righteous king Hezekiah, when the Israelites took the bronze serpent and worshipped it as a deity, they start worshipping it with other idols. It says Hezekiah destroyed the bronze serpent, which they called Nehushtan. So the true God will not allow any of his true followers to take an object and deify it and make it into a God that intercedes for them. And that's what he did. Hezekiah, 2 Kings, chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. Right there. All right. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love. To thousands, of gener uh, to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. I, want, I want to say something quickly. Um, I find it very ironic. Uh, when Muslims refer to Zoroastrians, uh, like in, in the past, I heard this quite often. It is also mentioned in some uh, Islamic uh, books, also in the translations of certain hadith. Uh, Zoroastrians or, or Magians are often referred to as fire worshippers. But uh, if you think about it, Zoroastrians don't actually worship fire. They mm -hmm. only use fire as a means to worship uh, the truth or worship God. So they basically do the same thing that Muslims do with the Kaaba. Muslims don't worship the Kaaba. They just uh, bow toward the Kaaba or venerate the Kaaba and do that in order to worship God. And Zoroastrians, you know, venerate the fire and bow toward the fire in order to, to worship uh, their God. But so many Muslims, including Muslim scriptures, refer to Zoroastrians as fire worshippers in a derogatory way. Shouldn't then, by the same logic, Muslims be the uh, rock worshippers or Kaaba worshippers? 100%, yeah. <laughs> and by the way, I didn't add that point because I was just think, uh, focusing on the black stone, but I think we need to add this too, Dave, for the sake of the Christians here mm -hmm. who may not know. Even the Kaaba, when they face the Kaaba, as AP has been saying it, I don't know if you've been catching it, he's not just referring to the black stone, but the Kaaba structure itself. When Muslims bow towards the Kaaba, that's idolatry itself. Now, I've heard the objections by the Muslims saying, well, hold on. The Jews in the Old Testament would face the temple in Jerusalem and bow to it. Now, let me explain the difference. And Christians, this is not being inconsistent or du uh, duplicitous. It's being consistent with what the Bible says about the temple. So write these verses down, because we're not going to look at them, but just write these references down. 1 Kings chapter 8 verses 12 to 13 first Kings chapter 8 verses 12 to 13 read the entire chapter and then you go to second Chronicles chapter 6 verses 1 to 2 second Chronicles chapter 6 verses 1 to 2 and read the entire chapter and then second Chronicles 7 verse 12 and verse 14 second Chronicles 7 verse 12 14 read the entire chapter God says that I will dwell in the temple in a unique way so whether you're an atheist or not, it's irrelevant to at least what the text says. The text is saying the God of Israel is going to localize his presence in a unique way, in a real way, so that he's truly present in the temple, though he's not bound to it. This is confirmed by Jesus in Matthew 23, 21, where he says, if you swear by the temple, you not only swear by the temple, but you swear by him who lives in it, who dwells therein. So when the Jews are bowing to the temple, it's not the temple. It's because they take God at his word. They believe God when he says, my name dwells here. My presence is here in a unique way, in a localized way, without being bound to it, because he's still in heaven while his presence is in the temple. So they're bowing to the God who lives in the temple. But I do not know of a single Muslim, and there are Muslims here listening, who would say Allah dwells in the Kaaba, that Allah's presence is in the Kaaba in a unique way as he's above the seven heavens. So when we bow to the Kaaba, we're bowing to Allah. So with that said, the Kaaba is devoid of Allah. Allah doesn't dwell there. So why in the world are you bowing to that building? That's idolatry too. That deserves a whole uh, video topic, a whole complete analysis. It's really important. Yeah, g guys, yeah. guys, do, do you... Do you, under, do you understand the, the significance of the, the point here? We, we brought it up in various contexts, but um, Muslims around the world all pray facing this cube, 
which just so happens to be the same cube that the pagans of Mecca bowed down, right? The same black stone that Muslims go and kiss and smooch is the same black stone that the pagans of Mecca, the same environment that Muhammad grew up in. It's the same one, right? But you ask, hey, Muslims, why are you, why are you bowing down to this cube and why are you smooching this black stone? Oh, because Muhammad did it. Muhammad did it. We're doing it because Muhammad did it. Well, why, if, if Islam is really the religion of pure monotheism and devoid of idolatry, why, why would your prophet tell you to bow down to this cube that was a pagan shrine and to smooch this black stone, which is supposedly conscious and is going to intercede for you and so on? Uh, why all of this stuff that looks like idolatry? Oh, you know, we, we, it, it, we just needed a direction of prayer. And that, that's amazing. If, if, if I went to any Muslim and I showed them, look, here's a picture of, darn, I'm getting an idea now. Um, right. I, should, I should do this, right? I should, I should take a picture of Muslims worshiping at the Kaaba, replace the Kaaba with this, with this cup and say, would, would, would you consider this idolatry? If, if everyone was bowing down to this and they just said, oh, you know, well, <laughs> our prophet said to do it and we need a direction of prayer. So that's the only reason we're doing that. Um, if, if everyone is bowing down to this bottle cap, right? Wouldn't you think there's a problem? Why? What, what, why? Why are you bowing down to that thing? To that thing? You. You claim to be the religion that's free from idolatry and so on. And from all outside appearances, Islam seems like the most idolatrous religion in the history of humanity. It's constant over and over and over again throughout the day, bowing down to a big pagan cube. That is so funny. I've, I haven't actually thought this deeply about a certain matter. I mean, I talked uh, in the past about the Kaaba and about how, uh, you know, according to according to the to the Sirah and um, even according to the Quran, not in complete detail in the Quran, but we know that Muslims, uh, according to the early uh, biographies, uh, at first prayed toward uh, to, toward Jerusalem as the Jews do. So they imitated uh, what the Jews are doing. I don't know if you if you've just uh, mentioned these details, Sam. Um, but they prayed toward, they did what Jews were doing because Jews were doing it and because Jews were monotheists. But Jews were just doing this because, uh, as you said, for them, that has actually value. They are actually praying toward, you know, the, the, the house. They're actually praying toward the location uh, of God, the representation of God. And uh, Muhammad and his people supposedly did that for uh, temporarily for a while. But then Muhammad was so upset by Jews mocking him that uh, he turned around and started praying toward the Kaaba, toward Mecca, which was then even announced in the Quran, where the Quran says that uh, that Allah now wants Muhammad to pray toward uh, Mecca, where he always wanted to pray to, and uh, that, that the former direction, so praying toward Jerusalem, was only to test who are the true believers. So uh, what Muhammad does is that he actually adopts the the, the 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 concept of praying toward a location of uh, God as the Jews did, but then Islam turns it around and, and prays toward Mecca, which uh, completely rejects such a notion that Allah has a house and uh, in a location. So, you know, so the, so the point really this this needs to be, uh, you know, summarized and analyzed. I would actually love to make a make a video on this. He adopts the system. But then does it does it in a in a different way and then completely rejects the entire concept because he doesn't know why Jews pray toward that direction to begin with. He forgot. <laughs> <laughs> he forgot. That's like yeah. his God. All right, let's uh, let's continue going through the Ten Commandments here. All right, so seven was you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Yeah. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Stop. What? <laughs> yeah, dude. But if you want to finish it, go ahead. I'll let you finish because it goes from 8 to 11. But okay. remember the Sabbath day. Stop. And by the way, in a future session, maybe we'll do a session where how the New Testament fulfills all those commandments in Jesus. Because I don't want Muslims to say, well, hey, you Christians, you violate Ten Commandments too. No, we don't. It's fulfilled in Christ. They're fulfilled, but, yeah. If, yeah. But now finish it because he violated okay. the Sabbath, but finish it so people get an idea why God sanctified the Sabbath. All right, so remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. 
On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now here, here's what's funny. AP brought up in his video, and you guys got to watch the video. Muhammad affirms the six-day creation of the Pentateuch, the Genesis account, in several places. He mentions Allah created all things, heavens, heaven and earth in six days. Let's look at some of the verses. Chapter 7, verse 54 of the Quran. Chapter 7, verse 54. Surely your Lord is God who created the heavens and the earth in six days. I wonder where he got that from. Then sat himself upon the throne, covering the day with the night, it, it pursues urgently, and the sun and the moon and the stars, subservient by his command. Verily, his are the creation and the command. Blessed be God, the Lord of all being. Chapter 50, verse 38, it's, it's relevant to this topic. 50, verse 38. There are several more, but chapter 50, verse 38. We created in the heavens, the heavens and the earth, and what between them is in six days, and no weariness touched us. Did you guys catch that last statement? No weariness touched us. Because in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, after God finished creating the heavens and the earth in six days, it says, He saw everything was very good, and He rested and sanctified the seventh day, <clears throat> calling it the Sabbath. So Muhammad, again, being an ignoramus, being illiterate and <clears throat> uneducated, assumed that when the Jews said God rested, it meant that God was tired, and He needed to sit back on His lazy chair, and maybe drink some cosmic juice. And so Muhammad's response is, is, to it is, and no weariness touched us. He didn't understand that the word rest comes from the same root, and it means to stop and cease from what you're doing. It's not rest in the sense that God is tired. Oh boy, that was rough. Especially creating woman, AP, that was really hard. Making her from the side, Adam, that took a toll on me. I need to rest. <laughs> the point of the passage is, after he saw creation being very good, up to his standards, he refrained and he stopped from adding anything else to creation because it's complete. Now he enters into his role of sustaining it. So now notice the ignoramus Muhammad. He affirms the six-day creation but doesn't understand the theological import of it. Why did God even speak of creation in six days? In order to set forth a model for Israel to imitate God's work ethic, that they too work six days and rest on the seventh day. And he missed that entire point. That's the point of the creation account. Look, imitate your God. I work six days in creating all things, and I rested on the seventh day. And I want you, my people, to imitate my work pattern, my work ethic. Work six days, rest on the seventh, and repeat your pattern, which is the entire point of the creation account. And yet Muhammad quotes the six days of creation, drops the ball when it comes to the import and significance of the Sabbath, and doesn't even have a Sabbath day. A lot of people don't know this. Islam doesn't have a Sabbath day. Even Jamaat prayers, it's not a whole day in which they refrain from working. And AP, you know better than I. Yeah. Is the Jamaat prayer, did you stop from working entirely or only for the time of prayer? Only for the time, yeah. You that was it, right? Afterwards. Yeah. And the Hadith say why he adopted Friday. You know why? He says, well, the Jews worship on Saturday, Christians worship on Sunday, we'll do them one better. We'll gather on Friday and worship. So he did it to spite the Jews and Christians. Mm -hmm. There you go. And he even claimed that Friday was the actual, was the what, what, what was the true day yeah. of Allah, and that the Muslims have the honor to revert to the true day of Allah or something like that. Because right? remember, the last thing he created was on Friday was Adam. It was a Friday, not a Saturday. So how do you feel, AP? Ha, ha, ha. Mm. <laughs> <Push> you, boy! <laughs> so the, the funny thing is... Um, Really, I, tr I tried to bring that up in my video too. Um, you know, the it says uh, that Allah did create the world uh, and the heavens in six days, as the as the, as the Bible teaches. It then goes on, um, you know, to talk about the seventh day, and uh, there it completely again. It Muhammad hears from the Christians and the Jews that God rested on the seventh day, but Muhammad, of course, misunderstands that and thinks that that is uh, that that refers to a physical resting out of necessity. And of course, Muhammad immediately thinks that's wrong. It's blasphemy. It's, that doesn't work. No, God is strong. He doesn't need to rest. You know, like Muhammad he's your teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a teacher boy. He's smart. Allah strong. And that's what he says. So, uh, uh, there he says that is blasphemy. There is no seven. There is no resting on the seventh day. That would never happen. 
But then, uh, because Muhammad misunderstands the whole situation and rejects the whole uh, concept of resting on the seventh day, because that's a that's too much of a human-like thing, it kind of contradicts with the with the rest of the story. Because Muhammad still keeps the notion of God creating or Allah creating the world in six days. I mean, if he took the resting soul literally and said, "No, Allah doesn't need to rest." that's blasphemy, then why didn't he have an issue with creating the world in six days? Isn't that also equally uh, okay. meaningless? Isn't, so, isn't that also equally blasphemous to him? Yeah. Shouldn't that also uh, be a problem to him? Why Why does the Quran keep uh, es establishing himself on his throne? Isn't that also blasphemy by the same logic? So uh, the Quran, Islam, Muhammad have a huge inconsistency problem here. And this is a clear uh, inconsistency, a contradiction with the Ten Commandments. Yeah. No, but I got to correct them, Dave. I can't let this guy get away with it. You don't understand. The six days, it means six periods, AP. The word yom can mean periods. It's confirming evolution. Big bang. You kafir. You munafik. <laughs> and then on top of that, because you're such a kafir, you dirty kafir, you don't re remember that Muhammad then abrogated six days. Don't. What's wrong with you, you munafik? Didn't they teach at madrasa? Because then he goes on in chapter 41, verses 9 and 12, to say it actually took eight days, ya kafir. See? He abrogated six days. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so, I'm two I'm days, sorry. four days, and two. Nee, 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 nee. Got you. There you I, go. I, I, I apologize, Sam. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for correcting me. Please uh, humble enough to accept correction. Zazel, uh, Zazel here said, uh, how about them bowing down to your origami pig? So the, uh, the, the idea is that I could co sort of combine things that I'm doing. And if I wanted to give them an example of what it would look, what it looks like to everyone else when they're bowing down to this giant Borg cube, um, that you know, replace it with other things, and then they'll suddenly get it. Whoa! Yeah, if we were bowing down to anything else, it would we would clearly say these people are pagan. And so maybe I'll maybe I'll uh, Photoshop my origami creations. Hey, that could be cool. That could be something. You know, if I'm if I'm auctioning these off, you could get a picture. You could get the creation, you could get the, the, the origami sculpture, but then an actual picture of <laughs> thousands of Muslims bowing down to it. So that would be awesome. So uh, I could work on my photo work on my Photoshop. All right, back to the Ten Commandments, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so verse twelve. Honor your father and your mother. Stop. The oh my goodness. <laughs> Let's finish the verse. Go ahead. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Now, Sam, how did Muhammad not respect that okay. verse, that commandment? Ready? Here you go. Chapter 9 of the Quran, Surah al Tawbah, chapter 9, verses 23 to 24. O believers, take not your fathers and brothers to be your friends if they prefer unbelief to belief. Whosoever of you takes them for friends, those, they are the evildoers. Say, if your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your wives, your clan, your possessions that you have gained, karmas you, may, you fear may slacken, dwellings you love, if these are dear, more beloved to you than Allah and his messenger and to do jihad in his way, then wait till Allah brings his command. Allah, God's not, God, Allah guides, man, this is Quran, whew, guides not. <laughs> the people of the ungodly. So there you go. And one more, David, one more. Chapter 58, verse 22. Chapter 58, verse 22. Thou will not find any people who believe in Allah and the last day, loving those who resist Allah and his apostle, even though they were their fathers or their sons or their brothers or their kindred. So you cannot love your parents or your siblings. And if you don't love them, notice what Allah will do for you, Muslims. For such he has written faith in their hearts and strengthened them with a spirit from himself. And he'll admit them to gardens beneath which rivers flow to dwell therein forever. Allah will be well pleased with them and they with him. Allahu Akbar. They are the party of Allah. Truly it is the party of Allah that will achieve felicity. So you must not love, you must dislike and hate your parents and siblings if they're not Muslims and they don't believe in Allah and his messenger. It's funny. I actually wanted to bring this up in my video too as a... As a um as a refutation to that uh, commandment in Islam. I thought about that so so long 
then I thought, should I really be doing this? This is kind of uh, where Islam contradicts itself in its attitude toward parents. And on one side, it says that you should honor them. On the other side, it says you should hate them if they are uh, not Muslims. I just left it at that, but I don't know. But this was a very good summary of that. Dude, it's abrogated, Kafir. No part about loving your parents. What's I'm wrong sorry. with you? Didn't they teach you in madrasa abrogation? Allah <laughs> You forgot to say I'm your teacher, boy. You have to boy, say I'm your teacher and your mommy, boy. Cuddle <laughs> Give me some dough. Smother me like a black stone. No. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So now now things now is where things are gonna start getting more difficult for you, Sam, because it's easy to be all nitpicky with theology and so on, but now we're getting into some very clear commands that re that apply to basic morality. And we know Muhammad, since he's the pattern of conduct. According to the Quran, Surah 33, verse 21, Allah says that Muhammad is a pattern of conduct for mankind. Uh, obviously, obviously, he's not going to violate any of these crystal clear right issues. Now. now, prepare. All right, we'll just, we'll, I'll just zoom through. I'll just zoom through these because there's no way you're going to want to stop me at all in any way. All right. So, verse 13, you shall not murder. Stop. <laughs> Wait, what? Stop. <laughs> That's the funniest. <laughs> but we'll add the others if you want, or we can just go with murder first. Oh, you can go, you uh, can because... go with murder, and then I'll and then I'll go through, and then I'll have no problem continuing going because there, there's no place you're going to want to cut me off. All right, go. Ahead. Because uh, what I did was not only did he murder, but he also lied, bore false witness to murder. Here, we'll give you okay. one example. Okay, all right, all right, all right. I'll, I'll go ahead and read a couple. Um, yeah. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. Stop. Wait, come on. <laughs> All right, just just go with what you want. Okay, let's do the adultery part because I'll combine the murder with the bearing false witness because he he did two things, he murdered people and used lies and deceit and trickery to do so. But let's right, take right, adultery. Right, we, we got we got we got we got to take we got to take these four things in here. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. Stop. You, what the heck, man? <laughs> but <laughs> you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. All right, so four <laughs> things there, Sam. It sounds like you're. <laughs> You're bearing, you're bearing false witness by saying that Muhammad violated these, unless you could back it up with evidence. Let's see, well, yeah, what, let's see what you yeah, got. Well, yeah. Some Please. of these Please. are going to tie in with the others where it says, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Now, as far as adultery is concerned, we all know not only did he commit adultery, chapter 4, verse 24, we know the command. Uh, married women are unlawful for you, except those whom your right hands possess. We all know this tradition. AP's done videos, you've done videos. In Sunan Abu Dawood, Ch uh, number 2150 it says that this passage chapter 4 verse 24 was sent down because the muslim jihadis had taken beautiful women captive who were still married so they were lusting after married women now the verse came down saying hey they're your captives you own them you can have sex with them and they don't have to consent because they're your property, even though their husbands are married. The only thing was they were supposed to give them enough time to make sure they were not already pregnant. So in chapter 4, verse 24, Allah and his messenger sanction adultery and rape all in one shot. So what's wrong with that? So are, are you saying, Sam, are you are you really, are you seriously suggesting here that, uh, that, that the honorable Muslim warriors and followers of Muhammad should not be able to take the wives of their opponents after they honorably defeat their opponents and then use those wives as their own slaves and have sex with them without their consent. Are you really and, suggesting that that is bad? And then sell them off. But he's got a point, though. He's got guys. He just refuted me. The only guy that's refuted because you know what? What greater honor than to have a married woman have Abu Bakr and Umar plow into them? Yay! Yeah. He it's Abu Bakr. <laughs> oh, wait. I, I got one better. It's Umar ibn al-Khattab, who Muhammad said was like a prophet. Nee, 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 nee. Come yes. on. Smother me like you do the black stuff. <laughs> Smother me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do I refute you? It's a, you're right. It's an honor. It's an honor to be defiled, treated like a piece of meat, to be defiled with my husband alive. It's an honor for someone to sleep with me against my will, even though my husband's still alive, what greater honor than to be defiled and treated like a piece of meat, a man raping me without my consent for him to be intimate with me, and a man 
committing adultery with me against my will, what greater honor? Because then I'll be transferred to paradise and I'll be one of the hoodies where the Muslim men will have eternal erections and I'll have firm, swelling breasts. I won't need plastic surgery. Yeah, yeah. If, if I, I am a man, if I am a man, and if Allah is my God, then I should be able to fight the disgusting, filthy disbelievers who are the enemies of Allah. I should kill their men. I should take their wives, pick out those that are beautiful. I should take them as my slaves, even if they are, even if they, if I, if, if I didn't kill their husbands, even if they still have husbands, I should take them and together with my four wives that, that wait in their separate homes and rooms, I should be able to have sex with this, with one of those beautiful slaves that I took from my honor, my, my opponents that I have defeated honorably for my fantastic, beautiful God, Allah, and his perfect prophet, Muhammad. How is how is this wrong? If you are suggesting that this is somehow you immoral, here, you are making a very immoral suggestion. I should also afterwards go to uh, the paradise that Allah has promised us uh, in the Quran, and I shall there recline on uh, a wide seat. I shall uh, watch the rivers of wine and where my slaves bring me cups, and I shall have sex with many beautiful who reese who are much more beautiful than all those women that you see on this uh in, in this life in this world it's i'm a man hey pete look dude you made such a strong case even my imaginary friend there's this wall right here that i talk to have conversations with because i'm alone his name is timmy and he's about to come off the hinges he's saying dude ap's off the wall let's go take shahada man there is no God, but Yahweh and Muhammad is the tool of Satan. That's it, AP. I'm done with. I'm over with, David. I can't do apologetics. This guy refuted me. He Alhamdulillah. He finished Alhamdulillah. Now, but AP, can you do me a favor, though? Yeah. yeah. Can you kiss me and smother me like Muhammad did the <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I can't even have you on the same show anymore because you're, you're too busy entertaining. <laughs> Uh, maybe we have to be careful here. Uh, yeah, go, let's, let's, let's go. Now, let's if you want to talk about murder, there's going to turn murder and also lying deceit. Here it goes. Yeah, this yeah, is Bukhari. Yeah. I, I got many and we got many. Mm -hmm. yeah. But here's one so obvious. Sal Bukhari, volume 5, number 369. Sal Bukhari, volume 5, number 369. Narrated Jabir ibn Abdullah. <clears throat> Allah's apostle said, Who is willing to kill Kaab bin al Ashraf, who has hurt Allah and his apostle? Thereupon, Muhammad bin Maslama got up saying, O oh Allah's apostle, would you like that I kill him? The prophet said, yes. Muhammad bin Maslama said, then allow me to say a false thing, i.e. to deceive Kaab. The prophet said, you may say it. I mean, I can read the rest of it, but you know what happened. They murdered him in cold blood, pretending to be his friend, setting him up and killing him. And not only did Muhammad say, go murder this man, whose only crime was to speak against Muhammad's injustices, right? to speak about how Muhammad was unjust and cruel and robbing caravans, right, and justifying it. That was his only crime. And what did Muhammad do? Not only do you have permission to murder him, you can lie and use trickery and deceit to do so because Muhammad said war is deceit. So there you go. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can give you more. I think that suffices for now because we got another one that's going to be a big one. The rest of them. Unless uh, AP wants to add something. Uh, go ahead. Beautiful. That All right. Beautiful. So you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal from the <laughs> that's the prophet <laughs> of robbery there. Right. You shall not Care 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 robber. You shall not Sorry. bear false witness against your neighbor. All right. We're ready to go on to 17. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because this one we're going to have a field day with this one. All right. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or Stop. <laughs> Stop in the name of love. All right. Not only the adultery part, because I combined it together. You shall not commit adultery, and also you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, right? Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> what story do I have in mind, uh, uh, APN David? Was there a situation that Muhammad lusted for his neighbor's wife, who was also his adopted son? Yeah, so he's, he's more than a neighbor. He's a neighbor. Adopted he's a neighbor, son? but he's more than a neighbor as well. Yeah. Uh, and then what did he do to then save face after he precipitated a divorce? Because Zayed, out of his love for Muhammad, said, I'll divorce her for you. Muhammad, out of embarrassment, said, no, no, no. He went ahead anyway. And then the verse came down, 33, 37, saying, hey, why were you afraid of men? You were hiding in your heart what Allah was about to make known, that you had lustful desires for a married woman who happened to be your daughter-in-law. 
And so let me just read, let me read Muqattal bin Sulaiman. And interestingly, guys, I love Yasser Qadi for some reasons, and I dislike him for others. Yasser Qadi is really destroying Islam. Praise yep. the Lord Jesus for Yasser Qadi. He just came out with a discussion yesterday. He just came out yesterday doing a talk. Guys, if you can, save the video because I suspect he's going to delete it like he did with the holes in the Quran. <laughs> Deleted that. He just admit the earliest tradition and the majority of scholars and Muhammad's companions affirm that the child of sacrifice was Isaac, not Ishmael. He's on record affirming something that David and I know. We've been saying for years that your earlier sources didn't say it was Ishmael, it was Isaac, and the Muslims would attack us. Thank you, Yasser Qadi. You're the gift that keeps on giving. But even more importantly, he's got a session. He did a session on the Sirah of Muhammad. In one of the videos, which is still online, look for it. He talks about the Zainab incident, and he admits again, man, this guy's amazing. You think he's an undercover Christian or an agnostic atheist. He admits that the earliest sources teach Muhammad started lusting. He didn't use the word lust. I'm using the word lust, but this is the gist of it. Muhammad actually started desiring Zainab, and Zayd found out, and Muhammad tried to convince him, don't divorce her, because this is going to bring a scandal. Zayd did so anyway, and Muhammad married her, and he admits the earliest sources confirm that the reason why Zayd divorced her is because Zayd found out Muhammad was lusting for his wife, and out of his love for Muhammad, he was willing to get rid of her for Muhammad's sake. And by the way, that tells you the view of women to these Muslims. They would pass out women to one another like it's candy. They had no respect for women. It's like if David started lusting for my wife, I'm not going to say, okay, David, here, I'll divorce you. You can sleep with her. I'll say, man, what's wrong with you, dude? This is my wife. Mm -hmm. How do you dishonor me this way? But the Muslim Ummah didn't care about the woman. Oh, hey, you like my wife? I divorce you. Go ahead. She's yours. They would pass the women like candy. So now let me read one of the earliest, one of the oldest expositions of this incident. Muqattal bin Sulaiman al-Tafsir, volume 3, pages 492 and 494. Even al-Tabari confirms it. And Yasser Qadi lavishes praises on al-Tabari. He goes, hey, al-Tabari is al-Tabari. He's one of the best. But I want to read this one that predates Tabri. Only after some time, Zayd complained to the Prophet regarding what he had suffered with Zainab. The Prophet came to him and admonished him here. And while he talked to her, he developed likeness for her beauty, countenance and wit. It happened as Allah decreed. Let, let that sink in. The reason why Muhammad started liking Zainab, his daughter-in-law, and lusted for her, because what does he say? Allah decreed it. Allah decreed that Muhammad would lust for a married woman. The Prophet then returned and had in his thought what Allah had willed. So Allah willed for Muhammad to lust for a married woman and want to have her. Allah did this. Thereafter, the Prophet asked as to how had he been with her. He's talking about uh, Zayd. He again complained about her. The Prophet said, fear Allah and keep your wife with you while... He had in his heart something else. You guys understand? He's lying. He's being dishonest and he's being deceitful. He's lusting for her, but he's keeping it from Zayd. Keep her! But in reality, he didn't want him to stay married to her. But then Prophet, then the Prophet came to Zayd and saw Zainab as she was standing. She was beautiful, fair complexion, among the best women of Quraysh. Therefore, the Prophet felt an inclination for her. And while leaving, said, Praise be to Allah who turns the hearts. Zayd discerned. See, he discerned something and said, O Messenger of Allah, allow me to divorce her for she has haughtiness and is arrogant with me and her language also hurts me. So use that as a pretense. You know, she's, she's rude to me, right? So here, I'll divorce her so basically you can have her. The Prophet said, hold on to your wife and fear Allah. Zayd, however, eventually divorced her. So folks, the earliest records affirm, Tabari affirms, Muhammad saw Zainab, unveiled, started lusting for her, even made a comment that she heard, praise be to Allah who turns the hearts, meaning Allah has now caused me to desire this woman, and he walked away. She heard it, told Zayd, Zayd heard it, was uncomfortable, because he knows my daddy wants my daughter, daddy wants his daughter-in-law, daddy, she's mean to me, I'll, I'll divorce <laughs> her for you. No, no, my son, no, my boy, that's my boy, no. <laughs> 
Oh, keeper. He divorced her anyway, and then Muhammad married her. Now, let me tell you why this is an awkward situation. Can you imagine you're Zayed? The woman that you're sleeping with is now your mother. What do I mean by that? Because according to chapter 33, verse 6 of the Quran, Muhammad's wives are the mothers of believers. So here you have a man that slept with a woman who now ends up being his mother and has to view her as his mother, a woman that he was intimate with. That's number one. Number two, this woman was Muhammad's daughter-in-law because for all intents and purposes, Zayd was a son, albeit by adoption. So Muhammad marries his adopted son's divorcee, making his former daughter-in-law his wife and then his adopted son's mother. But then what does Muhammad do? He abolishes adoption because people were attacking him. How dare you take your son's wife? Because they used to call Zayd, Zayd ibn Muhammad, Zayd the son of Muhammad. And Muhammad said, you know what? Chapter 33, verses 4 and 5 of the Quran, write these down. Chapter 33, verses 4 and 5, and chapter 33, verse 40. Muhammad is not the father of any of men. Don't call them your sons. Name them after their, your, their fathers. They are your brothers. So he abolished adoption out of humiliation to save face, even though his reason for lusting for his daughter-in-law was to give other people a license to marry their adopted sons, divorced wives, if they wanted to. But then he ab abolishes adoption. So AP and David, help me understand. How so can to... this marriage... No. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead, finish. How could, how could, because this is a question I want you guys to answer. How could Muhammad marry Zainab as an example for other men to do likewise if their adopted sons divorce women and they wanted to then marry their adopted sons divorce wives when Muhammad then abolished adoption and Allah knew he was going to abolish adoption. Help me understand that. Yeah. Uh, do, do you guys understand the do you guys understand the problem here? Because especially you Muslims who are watching, if you get your minds around just this, if you just get your minds around this, this, this should be enough. Uh, in fact, um, uh, Abdul Salib, Abdul Salib, co-author of Answering Islam, was an ex-Muslim. He said this was the problem. This was the problem that caused him to, to doubt Islam. Right. And ult ultimately, uh, one of the biggest things that that caused him to leave Islam. So Muhammad takes the wife of his own adopted son, marries the marries the divorced wife of his own adopted son after causing the divorce by lusting after her, because this is all part of Allah's brilliant plan. But Allah explains why he needed this to happen. Surah 33, verse 37. Read it a thousand times. Surah 33, verse 37 of the Quran. Allah tells Muhammad, Muhammad. The reason I need you to marry this woman, the, the, the wife of your own adopted son, the reason I needed you to take her and marry her was to set an example for other men so that they would know that it's okay to take the wives of their adopted sons. It's that important. Notice, everyone, he could have just said it, right? <laughs> Allah could have just said it in his Quran, right? You can give a rule, you can give a rule and not need someone to go out and do it, right? I can say, I can say, uh, you, you can say all kinds of things, right? You can say, hey, um, it's okay to eat candy. The prophet doesn't need to run out and eat some candy to show you, right? God can just say it, right? So, so that's one kind of issue. One, God doesn't, I mean, God doesn't need to have a prophet do it in front of you for you to understand that it's okay. He can just say it. Uh, Two, two, how big a problem is this, <laughs> right? So it, it's Allah saying, Muhammad, it's so important. I need you to do this so that everyone understands it's okay. You have to do it. It's so important. Guys, I've never met a person in my entire life who's struggling with whether it's okay to marry the wife of his own adopted son. I've never met one. I've never met one. Problem. This is the only person I've ever heard of, right? Muhammad. A humanitarian yeah. crisis. Muhammad <laughs> is the only person I've ever heard of who had this problem. <laughs> but Muhammad's God is saying, Muhammad, you need to get on this man. It is. We can't. We can, the, do we don't have the. We don't have the United Nations yet. We need you. <laughs> we need you to do it, Muhammad. So, so that's that's number two. How, how big an issue is this that that Allah is saying this is so important that I need you to do this. But then, as Sam, put, as Sam points out, this whole situation causes Allah to abolish adoption. There's no more adoption. You can take care of an orphan 
in Islam, but you do not adopt that, that orphan into your family so that, that that orphan becomes part of your family, right? There's no more adoption. So guys, the point Sam is bringing up, if Allah is saying, Muhammad, I really need you to take the wife of your own adopted son and marry her because I need other guys to understand that they can take the wives of their adopted sons. Oh, and by the way, I'm abolishing adoption so this situation is never going to arise ever again in the entire history of humanity. Go. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> Are you serious, right? This is this perfect eternal word of Allah. This is some amazing stuff. What, all right, what do you guys think? Fantastic, fantastic. Well, I have to, I have to say a few things. I've made a few notes here. And uh, I knew I knew I had to uh, give Sam Shimon a free Islam lesson here today. <laughs> I, I, knew, I knew I had to give you a free lesson here. So I, I have a few points here uh, in response to uh, everything that you have just uh said in your Islamophobic rant against uh, against Islam and Muhammad on uh, coveting your neighbor's wife and adultery and all that stuff. So first off, you have mentioned that um, that Muhammad first said to his son-in-law when he said, hey, I think you want to marry my, my wife. So why don't you just go ahead and, and, and marry my wife, dear holy prophet, father? Muhammad actually said, no, keep your wife. So this is a sign that Muhammad was good. Mm. Muhammad was good, you know. He was good. Mm. He said, "No, keep your wife." He wasn't. He was not a liar. That was a prophet good. right lie. It was a <laughs> good. Yeah, it, was, it was a good act. It was good. Me prophet. Me one. prophet good. Me prophet mm. good. Me prophet me strong. Bad. White man strong. 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 This is number one. Number one yeah. refutation. Number two is. Uh, the Ten Commandments may say, so God may say in the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. But what if the wife is very beautiful? Oh, that, you got what me if too. The wife is very Burn. Beautiful. So, well, I'm glad Zain you're not a Muslim apologist, dude. Z Z <laughs> Zainab was very beautiful and Muhammad saw her unveiled. He saw her uh, in her beautiful form, which is why he was suddenly uh, be, what, what do you say, bedazzled, whatever. So that's, that's what happened there. Uh, it doesn't apply. Number three. Number three is you clearly do not uh, know this, but Muhammad was a holy prophet. He was the he was the the best human to ever walk the face of the earth. He was perfect, which means Muhammad had certain privileges, and the rules of Allah did not apply to the holy prophet Muhammad. Mm. Remember, Muslims are allowed to marry up to four wives. Muhammad is allowed to marry up to what 11 12 13 as, as much as he as he wants and there is even a, a quran verse which clearly says that uh he can take wives as he wishes and this is only for him not for the believers so muhammad has certain uh privileges which make him exempt from abiding by the laws of god or allah mm. uh this is why this is special very very much for muhammad so he can covet uh other people's wives including his uh the, the wife of his son-in-law number four objection is uh Muhammad was a holy prophet, as said, he was uh, one of the most important humans in human history. No, he was, sorry, the most important, the perfect human, which is why Muhammad had a high sex drive. Muhammad had a high sex drive. We see in one of the hadith, uh, it is mentioned that uh, the Muslims who used to say that Muhammad had the sexual strength of 30 men. 30 men. So there's 30 of you, yeah. or 30 of us. He had a very high sex drive, so it was not for him possible to abide by this law. And we see this in uh, number in objection number five, where you see that uh, Muhammad was once outside and he saw a beautiful woman walk outside. And when he saw that beautiful woman walk outside, he looked at her and he immediately got in big trouble. He ran home as quick as he could and had sex. He released his uh, mm. sexual desire, which he had for that woman that he saw outside immediately with his wife, Zainab, which he also married by coveting his uh, uh, the son-in-law's wife, uh, his, sorry, his adopted son's wife. Uh, I keep I keep uh, confusing those. So uh, thereby, we also see that he had a very high uh, sexual desire, which Allah gave him because he was so special. So strength of thirty uh, men. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hereby, I have uh, hereby I have I have completely debunked your objections. Yeah, you to destroyed Islam. me, bro. So yeah. let me just get let me just let people know how you destroyed me. Yeah. So Allah turned his prophet into a, a horny prophet. <laughs> Yes. With a supercharged sex drive so yes. that he could lust for even married women, yes. causing his son to divorce his wife so that yes. he can then ravish her and then destroy adoption as a result. So that because of that decision, you're going to have now hundreds of thousands, if not millions throughout history, orphans who cannot have parents because they can't be uh, uh, adopted. 
And then parents who can't have children because the wife is barren or the husband is unable to sire children, and the only way they can have children is to adopt children. Now, their dreams of having family destroyed, all because Allah turned Muhammad into a horny, super turbocharged lust machine, lust bag. And on top of that, Allah also had Muhammad run to one of his wives, having sex with her to relieve himself of his <clears throat> lust for another woman. So as he's making out with his wife, he's actually thinking of another woman. All of that because Allah wanted Muhammad to be an adulterous, douche bag, lust bag, super, super turbocharged lust machine. And this is the moral example for all people in all times. Subhanallah. Dude, where's the mosque? Give me the address to the mosque, David. I'm dragging me. I'm taking the shahada. This guy schooled us. Timmy! He schooled me, Timmy. <laughs> you, have, you have done it, Sam. I, uh, it was a beautiful summary of what I have said. Subhanallah. 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 And don't forget, it was the harissa he ate. Harissa. And you know what? Yeah. Well, growing up, my mom used to make harissa. And I always wondered why. Why, even as a kid, after I ate harissa, you know, something would happen to my body. <laughs> Now I understood. If only my mom had known that hadith, I'd say, Ma, what are you doing to me? I'm a kid. <laughs> All right. But anyway, there you go. Fantastic points. Thank you so All much. All right. For so uh, <laughs> just to finish out that verse, Sam cut us off right in the middle of it. But uh, Exodus 2017, you should not covet your neighbor's wife. You should not cover your neighbor's wife, uh, uh, your neighbor's house. You should not cover your neighbor's wife or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. And that means, ladies and gentlemen, we've gone through all ten of the Ten Commandments, and the Prophet of Islam, the perfect moral example for mankind, broke every single last commandment on the list. He's, no. the, pattern, he's the pattern of conduct. He broke them all, ladies and gentlemen. He broke them all. No way. That's why your Bible's corrupt. See? Proof. Guys, what more proof you want? The Bible's so corrupt. That's why Muhammad didn't follow Ten Commandments, because yep. those are human inventions. They're not the words given to Moses, alayhi salam, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Muhammad to be like Moses, and Musa, alayhi salam, would not have given those commandments for his prophet to break. See, you dirty Jews and Christians, you corrupted your scripture. Takbir! All right. Uh, well, we've been going. Uh, we've been going about two hours now. Uh, AP has some more information on this, but he actually has it. He actually has it in a video. So um, I can actually, unless you unless you want to cover it, but I could just send everyone to your to your, to your video to cover. Basically, the additional the additional information is how. Muhammad and Allah just have no clue what the Ten Commandments are. So you're sitting here wondering, why is Muhammad going down the list of the Ten Commandments, breaking all of them? He didn't know what they were. Allah yeah, forgot yeah. them like he forgot his name. <laughs> because the Quran says, uh, the Quran says here, uh, let me see, which, which, which verse, which chapter is this? Uh, this is chapter 7, verse 140. It says, uh, when it describes what happened on uh, Mount Sinai, it says, and we wrote for him on the tablets something of all things. Something of all things. <laughs> <laughs> instructions and explanations for all things, saying, take them with determination and order your people to take the best of it. I will show you the home of the defiantly disobedient. So what did uh, Allah give to Moses on Mount Sinai? He gave him all things. He gave him something of all things, the instruction and explanation to all things. And thereby Mo Moses then told his people to follow all things. And mm -hmm. what is all things? Well, it's all things. That's well, it, it, what ma it, it makes sense because the Quran is explained in detail. The Quran explains everything. And therefore, it's obviously, <laughs> obviously, it hasn't left anything else yet. What a beautiful religion. Yeah. I am now convinced. And you know what's shocking? An atheist convinced me to become a Muslim. Who would have thunk it? Only in Allah's bizarre world, you'll be convinced to follow Muhammad as the best example by an atheist. Great job, Muhammad. AP. I'm sure Muhammad. Muhammad Hijab is paying you on the side, undercover, Muhammad. and it's all a facade. Right? Oh, oh, hey, 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 hijab's paying all of us. 
Hijab's yeah, paying yeah. all of us, son. Can I get some of that money, dude? <laughs> you can get it. You can get it all, man. It's it's so much coming in that you know I can just pass this stuff out, man. It's like it's it's, it's like toilet paper around here, man. Give me oh, some. Wanna, you know you, you know what I'm gonna do when I'm when I'm when I'm shipping out when I'm shipping out my origami creations when I'm shipping out my origami creations, I I I, I might I might ship them in shredded twenties, right? To, you know for 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 padding. <laughs> That's how rich you are. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Mohammed Tijab. Thank hey, you. Hey, I don't mind if you send me some boxes of those toilet paper. I need some. Yeah, no so problem, no some. problem, no problem. Uh, all right. I, I want to say uh, about about the whole uh, missing Ten Commandments mm -hmm. uh, in the Quran. So um, it's really a strange thing. It's a really a, a weird implication. So on one hand, you brought it up. Uh, the Quran claims that it is uh, complete. The Quran says on several occasions that. Uh, that we explained everything in detail and we have not left anything out and everything is in detail. That, that's what the Quran uh, claims. That's what Muhammad also says. So uh, you would expect that if you read the Quran, everything that you read in the Quran is very clearly explained in so much detail and that <laughs> nothing that you need to know is left out of the Quran. But then you look at the story of, of Moses and, it's, and, and it, it doesn't say anything. It just describes some vague nonsense about how Allah spoke to Moses and gave him something of all things, the instruction of all things. Hey, and when... What's, go ahead. Oh, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just saying that that's actually, that's actually funny, right? So, so here you got... Here you got a, here you got a law saying, ah, yes, here it is. It contains, uh, it's perfectly clear and everything. And yeah. ju just like I, I revealed to Moses. Oh, yeah, what'd you reveal? You know, <laughs> all kinds of things. <laughs> Stuff. You know. Stuff. You all know. You know the thing, Joe Biden. You know the thing. <laughs> it's in there. <laughs> That's what I reveal. Matter of fact, you could go and ask the Jews right now. Did I reveal some stuff to them? Huh? Yeah, go ahead and ask them. Hey, hey Jews, did you reveal? Dave, they don't... Basically... <laughs> go ahead. By the way, Dave, just to let you know, what's ironic, even though we're joking about it, yeah. what was the most important event of the Exodus, the most important thing that led to them being taken out? Um, what led them to be taken out of Egypt? What was the last plague? The death of the firstborn because of yeah. the Passover, right? The most important thing in Israelite history, which they celebrate to this day, is not mentioned in the Quran. Mm -hmm. I mean, how ironic is that? That is the definitional moment of Israel being taken out of Egypt to become a nation was the Passover lamb. And when God saw the blood, he passed over. And that forced Pharaoh to let them go, <clears throat> starting, the, starting the exodus where they became God's people on earth. And that one event, the Passover lamb, which is celebrated to this day, not a single word about it in the Quran. No, no, so the Passover that, uh, that, that Muhammad actually saw Jews practicing and he asked them what they are doing? Yeah. Wasn't Not that sure. that? Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. Now, yeah. now, Sam, I mean, if Allah is really trying to keep people away from the sacrificial death of Jesus, do you, do you want people knowing about, about the blood of the Lamb that yeah. protects you from the wrath of God? hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. You see some diabolical there that the Passover, which points to Jesus, conveniently removed. No mention of it in the Quran. Mm -hmm. Oops. Oops. Oops, Muhammad. Oops. <laughs> it is so funny. I watched movies uh, when I was a child uh, of Muslims making, uh, you know, a, a retelling of the story of Moses and the Ten Commandments. <laughs> or, uh, you know, and, and I listened to other stories of Muslims uh, retelling the story of Moses and the Ten Commandments. And it's so funny. Where do you get this knowledge from? Yeah. Where exactly do you get the knowledge from of everything that's happened and of the Ten Commandments, including the name Ten Commandments, the whole concept Ten Commandments, and what those Ten Commandments are? Where do you get this knowledge? Do you get it from uh, the Quran and Islamic scripture? Where do you get it from? Oh, you get it from the Bible. No, or, or, which is or <laughs> or you just go with, or you just go with the Islamic version, right? Uh, and that's when God revealed a lot of stuff, you know. <laughs> he he spent some, he spent some knowledge to them. <laughs> oh, boy. All right, guys. Well, we've been going uh, over two hours now. Uh, it's actually pretty cool. Uh, Sam and AP get along really, really well. So maybe we should do. Uh, maybe we should. Uh, anytime we have a topic where Sam's written a bunch of articles on it and AP's done some videos on it, I think it'd be pretty cool uh, to come together and to go back and forth. And uh, I, I, yeah. I just, yeah. I, I know it, it. Part of the reason is I know it drives the the keyboard jihadis crazy when they see us all together and, and they can't get along and they all destroy each other. You know what I mean? 
Oh yeah. yes. All right. Yes. Uh, any final final thoughts on this? Oh, and, and by the way, if uh, if everyone could, I'll, I'll go ahead and include it in the description box after we wrap up. I'll, I'll include the link to AP's video because he's got a, he's got more to say on this. But he j he just he just came out with a video on this, um, so I'll include that. But if someone wants to to, to uh, put that in the uh, in the chat, if one of the mods wants to put that in the chat, so that anyone wants to click on it can click on it right now. Um, and again, links to Sam's channel and AP's channel. Uh, their Patreon pages, if you if you'd like to support them financially, all of that is in the description box. Uh, AP, final thoughts on this? Uh, well, I'm I'm really glad to uh, be here today. <laughs> I don't know why I'm giving a speech. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, no, yeah, we're getting along with, with with Sam. It's actually that I'm taking a lot of energy from Sam because he's uh, he has a very good way to present uh, the arguments and to present the knowledge. Of course, my uh, knowledge and understanding of all things is not uh, half as deep and uh, and good as Sam's understanding of knowledge of all things. Uh, because Sam looked into all things and knows all things. So you think I'm like the Torah of Moses? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. Just okay. as it is described in the Quran. Yes, okay. uh, and and I, I really appreciate that. I, 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 it's it's an honor. It's an honor, truly. Yeah. All right. I just want to say uh, I want to say thanks for the video because for years I wanted to do some Ten Commandments. I was lazy, but when I watch your video. Your video actually uh, motivated me <clears throat> to finish the article, and I finished it in two hours. So I'm also influenced by, yeah, honestly. Yeah. Uh, for, I've been, okay. I've been okay. planning thought... to write this. No, 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 serious. No, no, oh, yeah, it sounds okay. like no. For years, I've been planning to write an article how Muhammad violated Ten Commandments. I was okay. lazy. Then your video came out, and I watched it. I go, man, this is great stuff. You know what? I'm going to write it. And then David contacted me and said, hey, did you see AP's video? Let's do a talk on it. And within two hours, I finished the article. So I'm watching you, and I'm benefiting from you, and I enjoy what you do. And I know, even though you're an atheist, I do pray for you. And I ask God to just guide you and protect you and your wife for the glory of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Thank All right, and uh, glad everyone could join us. Here's a uh, here's a comment from Christ the Truth who said, uh, David, I was an ex-Muslim and you guided me to Christ. I was always doubtful about God, but when I discovered you, I became a Christian and my life has changed. I cannot thank you enough. So uh, shout out there to Christ is the Truth. Um, again, I think uh, I think the three amigos should uh, should get together. Maybe we should try to do it on weekends whenever we're free, because uh, mm -hmm. do yeah. something for uh, European viewers and uh, you know uh, Europe, Europe, Africa, Middle East people who um, you know we're normally we're normally going live at the wrong time of, of day for some of them. Um, so yeah, whenever we can, that would be good. And uh, also just got a got a request for a. Uh, to have Hatun and AP on at the same time. That should be uh, that should be fun. Um, all right. Uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, I will be live again, Lord willing, at eight o'clock p.m. Totally different topic. I'll be with my uh, I'll be with my friend Adam Coleman, who happens to be Good my man. only friend who's actually interested in sports. Uh, Sam will watch like some MMA or something every once in a while, but Adam's the only guy who you know watches football, watches basketball, and stuff like that. But we're going to talk about woke sports, woke sports, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. All right. So, uh, did did so LV just said in the in the <laughs> in the chat? We pray for you, AP. Yeah, not to you. <laughs> just because you're an apostate prophet doesn't mean I pray to you. Even though I got a statue of you and I burn candles to your picture, okay? Even though, even though we all gather around you and, and form a circle around you and bow down to you, uh, that doesn't mean that you know we pray to you. <laughs> Awesome. For those asking, by the way, uh, the way the, the reason uh, some people bring it up, the reason I move so much during the stream, and the reason I always drink something. This was, by the way, not blood. I was drinking uh, pomegranate juice. I don't drink blood life on a uh, during a stream. Uh, so the reason I do this is because I have ADHD and. Um, I have a very hyperactive mind and a very, very, you know, I'm a very movie and uh, drinking something always calms me down and keeps me focused. So oh. that's what I'm doing. I, I thought it was, I thought you were following the example of Muhammad's companions and drinking his blood. <laughs> Yeah, listen, that's, that's what like I do behind good, the screens. Nothing like a good glass of camel urine with some milk. <laughs> and blood and saliva. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, catch you next time in the ongoing adventures of... Muhammad. <laughs> uh, catch y'all at 8 o'clock for those of you who are interested in woke sports. Stay away from this one. So yeah. join us and you'll get woke too.